All right, we got a long one today. Um, title is as it was read. Um, this is a seven round mock draft, and it's going to be pretty podcasty style. So um, if you just care about your team, I just listed the teams alphabetically by city name. So first up is the Cardinals, last up is the Commanders. Um, this is seven rounds. Of what I would do, no trades. So this is not taking into account. Well, the Vikings like JJ McCartney. Just. The teams are sticking where they are, and I'm taking guys where I think, you know, in five, ten years, we're going to look back and say, oh, this guy should have gone first, right? Just purely through what I would do, seven round, no trades. Cool? Cool. All right. So, first up, we have the Arizona Cardinals. Um, Marvin Harrison Jr. is, and this is also somewhat serving as like a big board in a way. You can kind of view it that way, but I'll, you know, let you know when I have guys kind of higher, lower than where they would will go whatever um harrison jr is a top that now i have to go look at my big board um he is a top two player in this class for me um he is my second player in the class we'll get to my first later it's not caleb williams uh harrison jr is an elite receiver prospect all around when you talk about size um you know, he's not an insane athlete, but when you're 6'4", you don't need to be necessarily um, just elite at the catch point, knows how to use that length of his that he really has. Um, and sorry for any background noise, uh, try to edit that out. But um, yeah, it's just kind of the pure kind of, he's going to be good, right? And Arizona needs receiver help. Uh, with their second first round pick, Nate Wiggins, who is a pretty small body. Um, you know, at the combine, he was, uh, I want to say, he was at least a, a 170, I think, at max. Um, and I think he beefed up after that. He definitely skinnied down a little bit just for the 40. Um, that's what you know you kind of have to if you want to run the fastest 40 ever recorded um, at the Combine. You know, I don't think he has that kind of a speed in game. You know, it's definitely one of those guys where, like, he, he's not that fast. Um, don't take that and, and look at it like, oh, we're getting this elite speed receive or corner. He, You know, he's, he's good for sure. He's my corner four. Um, I believe I need to go look at my rankings, but he's my corner four, and I do like his upside. He is an athletic player, even though he's not as fast, you know, as like the, the four, two, one would suggest. Um, he's just a solid player. You know, I don't see a lot of bust potential in him. I don't see a super high ceiling in him either. I think this is a guy that, you know, worst case scenario, you kick him into nickel. Um, otherwise, you know, he's a, he's a very talented corner, just a smaller guy, you know, maybe some concerns downfield, but, um, yeah, he, he'll be a solid pickup for you at, at a desolate position. In the second round, I got them going Jonah Ellis. I like Jonah Ellis. Um, he's actually a first round player for me. He just kind of slips down here, um, into the top of the second round, but, uh, another one of those kind of just solid players, right? Where he doesn't have like this high, uh, ceiling and, um, you know, but he's not got a low floor either. And so this is just kind of one of those safe players where, like, I feel pretty confident that he could slide in there. Um, is that what you want if you're Arizona? That's debatable. You know, they probably want that more. And what I think they'll actually do in the draft is, you know, they'll go after more of that um, high upside athletic pass rusher. That's not what Ellis is. Um, but Ellis is a very smart pass rusher. got very good hand usage. And like I said, just he's going to be a solid uh, pass rusher, but nothing exceptional in my opinion. Uh, Tavondre Sweat is kind of your uh, Jordan Davis for, for Gannon here in Arizona. A, a true nose tackle. You know, he's going to slip down boards. I don't think he'll get beyond the third round, but, you know, when you get a DUI three weeks before the draft, it's just not smart. Um, and, you know, not a lot of people have a lot of patience for something like DUIs. So he'll fall down boards. I'd still feel fine taking him day two just because, like, he's one of those guys where, you know what he's going to be. Um He's going to be that he's Jordan Davis, right? <laughs> that's that's basically what he is. Maybe not as good of a pass rusher. Not that Jordan Davis is like an exceptional pass rusher, but like I said, he's that true nose tackle. He'll take up space. He's an eater in the run game. Uh, Bo Limmer, I'm a fan of. I think we he could end up being a starting center, and that wouldn't be too hard when you don't have a lot of center competition in Arizona. The rooms, Evan Brown and... Um, Froholt, I think it's, I don't know if that's how you say it, but it's not a strong room. So, you know, it's not like it, it'd be that hard for him to end up starting. Um, but I do like Limmer. You know, he's got some nice upside. He's a physical in the run game. Uh, James Williams, I list as linebacker slash safety. He played safety at Miami. Um, he's not 
athletic enough to play safety in my opinion. I think a guy like Gannon would know how to use him. He'd be a nice addition to the defense. I think you can use him as kind of... Um, I don't know if, if the Cardinals defense has a specific role for him necessarily. I guess it's just more... He, he, you can slot him in at linebacker. You can slot him in at safety. Um, that's about it. But I think he could be a solid linebacker at this stage of his career. He's just not got the 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 speed, the athleticism to play the safety position. Um, and I think you know him and Cameron Kitchens uh, just they they worked well together. But I don't know apart. Um, so he, he should be a solid linebacker at the next level. Um, Marshawn Lloyd is a pretty easy evaluation where in a way right because i was pretty high on him but like it's once he kind of realized that like he does really have some issues with like he, he just doesn't take open gaps and i don't know why but um be that as it may he he's got the best cut in this class like if you give him an open outside edge um chances like he's javante williams uh, a lot of similarities to javante williams where much faster but you give him that outside edge or some open field on the outside you know he's a one cut back but goddamn he can just boot it once he gets there so um you know he's, he's fourth round player for me miles cole is that kind of traitsy pass rusher that i was talking about earlier um you know I don't know exactly where he's going to go, to be honest. Um, I could see him going a lot higher than this. Maybe the fourth round, ultimately. You know, he's he's just one of those guys where, like, I, you know, he's, he's a very developmental guy. Um, besides that, like, there's not enough... There's not much there to say he's going to make an impact immediately, but uh, the upside's nice. Jarius Monroe, uh, just, you know, you're, you're getting kind of into the area here where it's just like, yeah, I mean, these guys could be solid, but, you know, more than likely they'll be battling to make a roster spot. Um, Monroe, just a solid corner out of Tulane. Gold has some nice... Um, if, if they were to go neighbors, I probably wouldn't take Gold here, um, but because they're going Harrison, who's more of that big-bodied... Um, not necessarily, you know, jump ball type guy. Um, Gold, who's much more of the, you know, kind of Debo Samuel-esque um, across the middle of the field slot guy. I like him. I'd like him um, in the, uh, oh God, who, who is OC in Arizona right now? I should know this. Uh, let's look it up really quick. Drew Petzing. Yeah, um, yeah, that fits. Yeah. Um, Trust me, thoughts gone into this. It's just I've been working on this for so long. I, I did the Cardinals like a while ago at this point, finalized theirs up. Um, I didn't go team by team. I went pick by pick, but it's just, you know, I finalized this pretty much a while ago. Um, the Atlanta Falcons moving on. Oh, I didn't. No, we're not moving on. Isaiah Adams, um, not, not a huge fan of, just kind of a, you know, maybe pick. I, I don't know. He's not someone I would personally draft, but you know, someone's going to take him. Um, Atlanta Falcons, Byron Murphy is where I would go at eight. Personally, I do like Dallas Turner. Um, he's, he's the best edge rusher in the class. Um, very athletic, a lot of great traits there. I'm just a bigger fan of Murphy. I, I do think that Murphy is a blue chip player. Um, I don't want to compare him to Aaron Donald, but like they're just, there simply are um, comparable traits there. Not just the size, but that's, I mean, that's one of them, right? Is that he is a smaller guy compared to most linemen, but he uses that to his advantage. And that's part of what made Aaron Donald so good was that he, he may have been the smaller guy, but he was just so strong and knew how to use that size to his advantage so well. And you can see similar things there with Murphy. He's a very good um, pass rusher and not a slouch in the run game at all. So, you know, I know a lot of people want to go Byron or uh, Dallas Turner here, edge rusher. I like M Murphy a lot. I that's where I'd go personally. Remember, this is what I would do. Um, Renardo Green is a one trick pony of sorts with upside, very, very good press man corner in zone. I don't know as much. Um, you know what the Rams here like again I do not take this out of context he's not Jalen Ramsey in the slightest Jalen Ramsey is a special was a special um pr prospect and a special player he is not Jalen Ramsey but there's there's Jalen Ramsey isms you know I mean it's just 
I think he could fit Raheem Morris's defense. Um, I like him there across from AJ Terrell. Chris Braswell um, is your edge player. I know that's probably not the Bama pass rusher that a lot of Falcons fans want. Look, I, I just think um, Braswell, who I feel pretty confident as like a uh, rotational pass rusher, you know, I, I'd rather have him and Murphy than Turner and like, you know, in the third round, you're getting guys like, um, you know, Christian Boyd at best. Would you rather have Turner and Boyd or Murphy and Braswell? I mean, it's a, what I would do draft, and what I would do is Murphy and Braswell. You know, I so I, I like that there. Uh, Dominic Puny, and I think is how you say it, in the third round um, from Kansas is a mauler. You know, I, I could see him being like a, you know, one of those guys where we look back on and we're like, damn, like, how did he last to the third round? Um, he could sneak into the second even. You know, he's, he's a really good guard. Uh, Daquan Hardy. He is a pretty solid slot. Um, you know, Mike Hughes is who I want to say is slot right there for Atlanta. Um, whoever it was wasn't very good last year. Uh, I think it was Mike Hughes. But yeah, anyways, Hardy's probably an upgrade. Um, and anytime you can get an upgrade at any position in the fourth round is is a good pick, in my opinion. So I like Hardy. I think he fits. Uh, Cameron Kitchens, this is your third defensive back selection. Um, and a lot of defense over here overall. But, um, you know, the offense is pretty stacked out, really. So you're just adding to the defense here. A lot of players that aren't necessarily, like... You know, besides Murphy, aren't these like super high upside? I just feel I feel confident that th these are solid contributors, and I kind of feel the same to Kitchens here. I know I'm lower on him than a lot of people. Like he's not lasting to the fifth round. Um, he it, it just it's where he ended up for me. I just view a lot of safeties above him, but uh, he's still a good get. You know, like I said, I'm taking if I'm Arizona, or I'm Atlanta here, um, these kind of safe prospects in a way on defense, but then following it up with a guy like Taj Washington, who uh, again I think I'm a little lower on than most people. I'm, I'm just kind of I, I'm I'm more on the uh, yeah he could be really good, but will he be is is my thing with him. Like I just don't I don't think he's got the, the traits of a a number two receiver even i think he's a number three at best um but you could be getting a good number three for the future here and then sioni vaki is an interesting player um i put safety slash running back because that's that's kind of his skill set to be honest um he's a safety at utah got involved in the running game and it wasn't too bad honestly so uh, you know i know the falcons don't need running backs right now but uh if you're giving them a fun weapon on offense and then you know you have a uh, safety as well which again i know it's your fourth defensive back selection but but really, I mean, the, the team, the roster is very well built, right? It's in a very good situation. Uh, like I said, you're just taking these guys to kind of go in now because I really think you've got a, a two, maybe three year window here with Kirk. So just go in now. Um, moving on to Baltimore. At the 30th pick, I took Tulis Fuanga. Um, you know, I, I feel fine about him. He's he's another one of those players where I don't see super high upside. I don't see um, a super big bust potential. He is very good in the run game for sure, and I'd be surprised if he doesn't end up a charter. To be honest, I, I feel pretty good about that. Um, for me, you know, he's just not um, number five overall worthy uh, at all. So, like I said, it's just he's a solid tackle. I think he'll be, you know, a starter at the next level, um, just not like a high end starter. And I don't see a lot of. Uh he doesn't have much to offer in the pass game. You know, he could end up converting to guard eventually. It's just that the Ravens need a right tackle and he plays right tackle. So there you go. Uh, Jermaine Burton in the second is a pretty high upside receiver. Honestly, I, you know, I mean, I think he can play for sure. There's an argument to be made. He like, I don't want to get too ballsy here, but could be, have been the best receiver on the Bama squad last year. Um, and I, I don't think he was done any favors. Just he's had some issues with, with health, I think, but you know, I'd like Jalen Milrow is not a very good quarterback, in my opinion. Um, you know, we're a year out from that. But J Jermaine Burton, he's a high upside guy, in my opinion, um, for the Ravens who kind of need that true number one. Like, they've tried finding it. Like, Zay Flowers is good, but he's a number two at best. Um, I actually think Burton has that number one upside. 
and we we I he, you know, he could be another one of those guys where we look back and say like dang how did we have so many receivers above him? Um, I like him, Dwight McLeathern, a uh, corner out of Arkansas. He's a physical guy. Um, I used to be much higher on him. There's just other corners overtook him. I think he'll probably end up going round three or so. And he's he's just this solid physical corner that you know is doesn't have any super glaring weaknesses, but also no um, shining brights to his game. Spencer Rattler in the fourth. You, you kind of need a backup quarterback right now. It, maybe you'd prefer to go somewhere else here, but Rattler was available. Um, obviously, you're not taking him to like you know be the future of your team or anything, but um, I, I do like him as as a developmental backup, and uh, he could be a pretty high upside backup that you know maybe you're able to ship off for pieces at some point or something. Um, Xavier Thomas, edge out of Clemson. This is about where I expect him to go. He has just kind of had a fall off. Uh, one point predicted to be or projected to be you know a very high pick, and uh, just yeah, you know, he's not going to end up being that. But that doesn't mean that there's still not potential there. He does have some nice athletic traits. Um, I do like. Like his first step but he's just got to be more consistent um I, you know i think he could be a bit more physical too sometimes when he does get physical it's kind of just you know throwing his hands around matthew jones um i really like here as a fit actually i think he could kind of be um potentially that substitute guard if things go bad with either Cleveland or Voorhees. Um, but I like both Cleveland and Voorhees. So really more than anything, this just kind of felt like um, a depth pick because uh, he can he can play guard. He looks like he's trying to play center now, I think. And uh, I think he can play both in my opinion. So kind of just a, a, a stash pick, but also a potential starter if need be. Uh, Dejan Edwards from Georgia, a solid chain runner, kind of your, uh, you know, I don't know if they signed J.K. Dobbins back, but kind of your Gus Edwards replacement. Iyabi Oki, um, not a lot to talk about there. He's just kind of a, um, I'm going to be honest, there were some filler picks at the end uh, where it just, you know, like he he's a solid player. He comes from a smaller school, um, but when you're a solid player at a smaller school, you know. Uh, Trajan Jeffcoat, on the other hand, though, is kind of the one where um, he just he's a player I expect to fall. He has some nice traits to him for sure, and he can be very physical at times. But besides that, like he, he needs to upgrade his arsenal. Um, he's not a, a profound player by any means. Moving on to Buffalo, A.D. Mitchell. Um, I'm still trying to figure out if it's a Donnie or Adonai, so maybe you can help me out in the comments. But hey, I'm just going to keep calling him A.D. Uh, Mitchell, a big physical receiver, um, not as big as we thought he was but still, you know, uh, good size. And my main thing with Mitchell really comes down to the fact that he's he doesn't possess um, the elite ball tracking skills that you kind of need to be like a, a true number one, in my opinion. He catches with his body a lot. And that's something that turns me off a little bit when it comes to evaluating those types of receivers, because, you know, if you're gonna be a big bodied go up and get it guy, um, when he's running across the field, I it just it's it's a body catch almost always and that, and again almost always that's I'm not saying always and I'm not saying he can't fix that but that's what kind of shies me away from saying like oh this is a this is a, a great receiver um he's just not on he's not even close to the level of, of the top three guys which we'll talk about later Javon Bullard is a pretty good safety in fact he's my safety too and yet he was all the way at 60 um Part of that attributes to the fact that this isn't a very strong safety class, but be that it is May, you're you know you're getting a, a pretty solid safety here at 60. Um, you had to let go of both um, Hyde and uh, Poyer went to Miami. Hyde, I want to say went to like the Jets or something. Uh, he might have even signed back. I don't know. Bollard, on the other hand, I, I like him. He's he's a nice little physical safety that gets really involved in the run game, which is you know one of his better traits. Um, this is a solid pick here. I think you know if you're looking for kind of just a replacement um, for more Jordan Poyer than Hyde. Uh, Nehemiah Pritchett is someone I've kind of <laughs> been up and down on uh, throughout the years. He's finally coming out, um, and I think he probably had his best year um, this past year which was not a very hard hurdle to clear, but you know, I mean, be that it is a May, he's an early day three guy for me who has some starting upside, but at the very best is a lower tier starter. Davin Van uh, out of NC State, 
is is one I don't know if the fit necessarily was was there as much as I would have liked, but he's a he's an athletic pass rusher who has some really nice arsenal, um, some moves in his arsenal. I don't have anything I can point to that's like a glaring thing for me. It's just more like he doesn't possess the you know he doesn't have a great first step, I guess, um, even though he is athletic. You know, he's just one of the, another one of those guys where it's like if you're be if you're getting picked here early day three, you know, you got some solid starting upside, but most likely you were a backup. Uh, Prince Pines, guard from Tulane. I liked him. I think he's a he's a, a serviceable enough guy at the next level who I don't know if he'll ever be a starter, but I, I, I'd i like him as a, my backup. Uh, same Kind of same thing with Walter Roos. Like, again, I don't know if this is a guy that's ever going to start, but is, if he can be a solid backup for me, um, fill in when needed, I'd feel comfortable, I think, with it. Bucky Irving, running back from Oregon, someone who I used to be really high on at a point. He was my running back one. Um, I think when I started out this draft process, he was my running back one. Um, it was either him or Braylon Allen, I think. But uh, I've always been a big Bucky Irving fan. And then, you know, you just kind of go more along and it's like, is he a one? No. And I can't draft a guy that's not a one that high. He might be a really good two. You know, he's very good at what he does. He is this small little bullet that, <laughs> kind of similar to Lloyd, um, just if you give him open field, like he's gone. But... You know, that doesn't work as much at the next level. You know, it just doesn't. You don't see that as many open fields like that. Defenses don't just lose you like that. Um, that's not to say it can't happen, and I think he'll have his moments, but, you know, it's just a guy that, at the end of the day, he's not going to be, um, you know, a team's starting running back. Jaden Cremetti, Cremetti uh, from Mississippi State is a good player who will probably not be good at the next level, in my opinion. I just don't see the any of the traits um of a guy who's going to have success at the next level um in terms of the the elite aspects of the game you know i mean i just if you're getting picked here it's for a reason <laughs> i gotta try and keep it fresh with what i'm saying somehow because a lot of these guys are the same in a way um if you're getting picked here right like you obviously there's there's traits there enough to where you could you can make a roster um but is he gonna be even a, a good backup i don't know <laughs> Uh, same thing with uh, Idofon Ulafoshio, is maybe how you say it. Um, some people are really high on him. I don't get it. I don't see it. He is not very good to me. Um, I know I have him in the sixth, but like you know, he's because he's not a horrible player. Like he's not unplayable. Um, but I don't get the. I, I've seen people taking him round two. I don't get that at all. Um, he's just not that good in my opinion. He's not. And in any, any level, like, I, I would say, you know, like, he's not really solid at anything. I guess it's one of those guys where I just really don't get it. Um, there's a few of those guys, but not too many that I'm, like, super different on. Devin Colt is a solid little get at the end of the draft here. Kind of uh, someone who had a really nice combine, has some nice athletic um, ability. But, you know, we didn't see too much of that at Washington, in my opinion. And he doesn't really offer anything um, as a tight end that's, like, worth taking much higher just because like you know at the best he'll, he'll be a tight end three maybe uh moving on to the carolina panthers i don't think a lot of panthers fans are gonna like this draft but we'll see i guess i really like the way it came out actually i really do think that the deontay johnson trade was a lot bigger of a deal than people think um and that's part of why I don't go receiver here until the fourth round. Uh, and I kind of focus on other positions because I really do believe that Deontay Johnson is going to be um, the thing that Bryce Young needed. He is the exact thing where I think Young was was able to make his, his reads and progressions last year. It's just that nobody was open and he had no time to throw it. Um, they invested so much money into the offensive line. Hopefully, Taylor Moten's healthy. And then you go and you add one of the best route runners in the NFL who, I mean, you know, at least half the plays that he's out there will be open. You just have to find him. I think that's exactly what Bryce Young needs. So for me, if I can go and I can take a guy like Trey Benson, who has the potential to be an elite running back, like, you know, not we're not talking... Nick Chubb, Derrick Henry's of the world, but can be kind of that tier two type running back. Uh, and then a guy like Ben Sinnott, who same thing, he's not going to be an elite tight end, but he could be in that uh, tier three ish of the world of the tight end world where you're, you're now adding these, these good players, you know, to just take an offense that was 
I mean, the worst in football last year to something respectable, at least. You know, you've, you've brought in Dave Canales, uh, you, you signed Robert Hunt, you signed Damian Lewis, I think, and you're just adding guys here. Um, and then in the third, you go Braylon Trice, who is someone that I'm a little iffy because of injuries, but if the injuries aren't a big issue, you're talking about a guy who could be really damn good, especially for, you know, it might be the first pick in the third round, but for third round value, I mean, and I think that's where he's going to end up going. Uh, if not for the injury issues, he'd probably be a first round player because he, he did have an elite first step at a point. I don't know if he'll get back to that, but but hence why he's a third rounder. But then I finally do target receiver in the fourth with Troy Franklin, who is a, someone a lot of people have going at 33. No, I, I, it's, this is another one of those guys where, like, I don't see that at all. Um, you're, you're essentially calling him a fringe first-round player. No. <laughs> um, he's Jonathan Mingo, I'm, I, as far as I'm concerned, which is the other thing I don't get why Panthers fans just want to draft Jonathan Mingo again. But uh, he's Jonathan Mingo, so I just I don't see the point and why you'd want to take him at 33. Uh, Jeremiah Trotter is, you know, another guy that kind of – uh, cooled over the course of the year. I, I honestly don't know where he's going to go. I think some team could like him and take him all the way up to the third. Uh, he could end up be going down to the sixth. I have him in the fifth here. I think, you know, he's a guy that, that's got some upside still in him, but really, I mean, he just didn't have a good year here at Clemson. And um, I don't know, it just it's hard to... Um, you can look at the old tape, right, and be like, oh, well, well I mean, last year, you know, he, he made some really nice plays and he showed some great, you know, so maybe he was hurt. I don't know, but it just wasn't a good year for him. Uh, Tanner Bordellini, kind of conflicting um, views on what I've heard on him. Some people really like him. Some people really don't like him. Um, I'm kind of more on the end of I don't like him, but, you know, I'm not really on, on either extreme. I don't see the, the traits that some people see um, for him to be like a, you know, a day two player, in my opinion, um, but I think as like a fifth rounder, someone who who could honestly start for you at some point. Um, and it, like I said earlier, if you can get a starter here in day three, I mean that's a good pick in my opinion. Uh, and then Bub Means at receiver, just kind of one of those guys where I'm just I, I like him. I'd, I'd like someone to at least take a shot on him in the draft. Um, there was a guy out of um, uh, out of the Louisiana school. A couple years ago, Nichols, Colonels, and I cannot remember his name, but this is basically that the, that guy this year for me where, um, you know, admittedly, like, yeah, he's not going to be um, a starting receiver at the next level, but I just, I like him. I, I like the, some of the skill set he has, and I hope t a team takes a chance on him, but I don't know if he'll end up getting drafted, and I gave him to you, Carolina, so you're welcome. Uh, Chicago's only got four picks to talk about here, um, which just makes you really think they, they definitely got to be trading down from nine, right? Like, I know it's tempting to just take another blue chip player up there, but, like, you got to get some more picks. Um... With the first pick, it's obviously Caleb Williams. Um, I know some people have Drake May over him. I'm not one of those people. For me, it's it's kind of cut and dry, to be honest. Um, Caleb Williams is probably, um, I want to say, the best quarterback I've scouted. You know, I've not been doing it for a long time. Like, deep scouting, I've only been doing since 21. General scouting, like, since 2018. Um... You know, I mean, like, I would definitely have him over, like, Bryce Young last year. Um, you know, 22 for sure. 21. I mean, I really liked Lawrence, so I don't know if I'd have... They're on that similar level for me. I do think Caleb Williams is that great of a prospect. I don't like to th throw a word around... I can't speak. I don't like to throw around the word uh, generational too much. It's not even that I have a big thing against it. Like, I just don't use it that much. Um, I much prefer the term blue chip just because when a guy's that good of a prospect, it's like, oh, yeah, he's a blue chip guy, which just feels a bit better than saying, like, he's a once in a generation player. Because uh, that's not how I would describe Caleb Williams. I don't think he is a one in, once in a generation player. We just had a player um, three years ago on the same level as him, so he can't be a generational player. But uh, I would definitely describe him as blue chip, you know, and. I'll say I, I am rooting for him. I, I definitely am rooting for him because I think a lot of the stuff surrounding uh, the whole, like, his attitude sucks, he's a diva, he paints his nails, and I, I could care less about that stuff. His teammates and his coaches all say that he's a phenomenal guy and a great leader, and 
when they had a defense, I mean, they won, right? So, and I know the main thing people will point to is, like, he plays hero ball. I mean, he was behind every game. You know, it's hard to, to not play hero ball when your team's traveling or trailing every game. Um, you know, so on that front, it's just like, I, I don't know. I, I guess I personally don't see... Uh, many of the issues that people have with him for me scouting him was just really fun to watch he's just one of those players where um he's like reading the field even when he's not he knows the plays so well obviously and he's just got that like i almost find it weird that one of his one of his critiques is he plays too much hero ball when 90% of the time his hero ball efforts work out um he really does make incredible plays so yeah i don't know i'm just i'm not on the same uh mind wave as the other people who you know don't like him as much and for me i just feel like if you're scouting this objectively it's a it's a pretty easy like yeah he's the best quarterback in the class right um i know i said that he's not my number one player in the class he's my number three uh we still haven't gotten to my number one yet but uh, I guess you guys have to wait and see who that is. Uh, maybe you've already guessed. I don't know. But uh, Roma Duns, Udunze. It's a Dunze. I always say a Duns. It's a Dunze. Uh, Roma Dunze is a really good receiver. And I, I said earlier, right, they got to trade down from nine. But I think that trade down from nine will be a team coming up to get a Dunze. Uh, if you didn't. If you didn't have desperate draft pick situation like you do with Chicago right now, I would love to just sit there and take a weapon when you've already got DJ Moore and Keenan Allen uh, for your young elite quarterback. Uh, adding a guy like Roma Dunze to that room with Cole Komet as well. I mean, I'm not, I'm not kidding. That could be the best receiving room in the NFL. I genuinely, Keenan Allen was having maybe the best year of his career besides injuries last year. Uh, DJ Moore is a very talented receiver. You know, he's not top four Adam Rank, but he, he's a very, you know, top ten at least. And then you're adding this big bodied, uh, in most other classes, receiver one with the ninth pick and you just got a gen you know well, i just said i don't say generational but you just got a generational type quarterback it's just exciting if you're a bears fan right like to pair those two together um christian boyd at 375 i talked about him a little bit earlier um i really do like christian boyd you know even though like he's not on the same level as the byron murphys and jerzon newtons um i do really like him he's uh I have a thing for Northern Iowa plays, and I don't know why, but uh, they almost always end up being solid, and I think this is a guy that, you know, at a position of need, which I don't generally like to go too much off of need, but at a position of need, uh, he's going to at least be a solid player, potentially a pretty good player. Um, I really like him at that kind of three-tech position. Um, with Chicago's defense, I mean, he's more of a defensive tackle, but, you know. DeCamrian Richardson in the fourth is the last pick for Chicago from Mississippi State. Um, and this athletic corner for sure that has some you know decent size to him and uh, not the most physical guy in the world but i just i like his ability to kind of he moves very well you know he's a very fluid athlete and uh, i like that there for the fourth round and i like that there for the bears in the fourth round with the cincinnati Bengals, um i went troy fatanu at 18 I actually think he'll go higher than that probably and um it's just kind of the way the board fell but like fatanu is really good and I don't view him as a guard. You know, I put tackle slash guard because he can absolutely play guard. But I think he's a tackle. You know, I don't I don't see the the arm the arm length. Um, I don't know what else would suggest that he can't play tackle. And even then, that's not an issue uh, for me because you know there's been multiple guys at this point that have proven that that's not an issue. And he's got the athleticism and the movement skills to deal with the fact that he's got shorter arms, even if that were a big, um, you know, uh, subversion, like he's a good tackle, plain and simply. And I think, you know, he's, he's, um, he's going to go higher than this. And I wouldn't be mad at a team for even trading up for him. Cause like, um, he's that good. Ennis Rakestraw, it might be Enos is someone that I'm admittedly a low, little lower on. I, I don't quite, I'm not quite there on first round. I never have been. Um, this is just a guy I don't see those elite traits in where I, I just don't feel comfortable saying he's going to be like a great number one for a team. You know, at best, he's a number one on a team that doesn't have a lot of competition. I'm not trying to diss on the guy, but it's just like, I, I don't view him as a first round type corner. I don't view him as a, a you know, a number one. Braden Fisk 
is someone that is definitely probably going to go higher than this because he did blow up the combine. And I was a little higher on him um, at first, but you know, you kind of watch his game a little bit more. Like he's he's just not um, he's not as athletic as his combine would would seem. Like he's an athletic player for sure, especially compared to most defensive tackles. But he's not like a freak. He's not um, you know on on the like that end of the spectrum. And I, I feel more comfortable taking him here kind of middle of the third round um, as someone who, you know, is probably not going to replace DJ Reader, but could be a serviceable backup um, at the very least starting next, maybe starting next to um, BJ Hill. Roman Wilson is a fit that I ended up really liking. Uh, I, I, you know, the Bengals low key kind of need receiver right now because we don't know if T. Higgins is going to be there after this year. Um, he, I think he will, but he potentially might not even play this year. You've lost Tyler Boyd. Uh, Roman Wilson can play that slot receiver. He can also go outside. I like him. I, I think he's a solid pickup here for Cincinnati. Uh, Cedric Van Pran Granger of Georgia. Another one of those guys where, like, I don't quite get the the hype on him like i've seen some people going second round on him i'm not there there's uh at least four other centers i would prefer over him i just think he's um i think he's a backup but you know a high-end backup blake corum is definitely an interesting conversation because he's someone that i am definitely like not I, I'm, I've always been a lot lower on him, I guess. I don't think he's a number one running back, you know, but for as, as, a, as a tandem with him and Zach Moss, I think that really works, you know, where Moss is more of your kind of big play guy versus Corum, where he's, he's just a chain runner, in my opinion. Like, I don't see him as much more than anything than a chain runner. And even then, like, Cincinnati's not got the greatest interior. Um... With Vitanu, right, like you're adding a guy that, um, you know, I'm I'm assuming if they were to go that route that they're probably still, um, well, actually, now that I think, oh yeah, Orlando Brown. Um, you know, if they were to take Vitanu, I, I don't know if he'd play tackle year one just because they signed Trent Brown, who's not moving into guard, and the uh, same thing with Brown. He's not a guard. So, you know, you're, you're playing Fatano at guard for a year and then swapping him out to tackle um, after Trent Brown's gone, right? Uh, so you at least have that piece for year one, and then maybe you can make some additions. But, like, you know, I don't know how well Corum is even going to do in this specific situation just because, like, he doesn't have a great interior if he's going to Cincinnati. Um, but again, just that tandem of Moss and, and Corum, they play well off of each other. Uh, Carson Barn Barnhart uh, from Michigan is a, a backup, and that's about it. He, he will be a solid backup at the next level. Uh, Tanner McLaughlin, I think is how you say it, McLaughlin um, from Arizona is a solid blocker. And again, that's about it. <laughs> you know, uh, it. I, I could see a world where he's a tight end one. Um, I don't think that's like crazy. He, he's definitely got some more upside than some of those other tight ends kind of being picked here late in the draft. But more than likely, I mean, he's a tight end too. Um, you know, I think he would serve that role well with um, Mike Kosicki. So, you know, maybe he could go a little higher than this, but just fell a little bit, I guess. Jalen Coker from Holy Cross is a receiver I expect to get drafted. I don't know when. I You know, max probably six round. Um, but Jalen Coker is a solid underrated guy who will probably end up making a roster as this like speedy, um, versatile type threat where, you know, you can kind of stick him outside, inside. Uh, you're giving Cincinnati some nice receiving weapons here with the departures of two of their big guys. Um, and then Austin McNamara, the punter. Yeah, we have uh, kickers, punters, and even a long snapper in here. Um, Austin McNamara is a pretty good punter from Texas Tech. Not my number one, but in most classes would be the number one. Just a solid leg and uh, with the Bengals, Brad Robbins was not good last year. Like he was one of the worst punters in the league. So, you know, on one hand, do you want to go draft another one the year after? I don't know, uh, but that's what I'm doing here because it's some friendly competition and I'm going to guess that McNamara wins that battle. Uh, moving on to the Cleveland Browns, who don't have a lot of draft picks. The first one, I went with a very much future-oriented pick in Christian Haynes. Uh, I'm sorry, I know you guys are good at rolling over cap and that it's not had a big effect so far. 
you guys are about to be in cap shit, pretty much. Hey, there's not much way around it. You're not going to be able to hold on to guys like Wyatt Teller and Joel Batonio, and you just paid Ethan Pochich, um, you know, six million a year. He's probably still gone after two years just because of where he's at in his career. Like, you're going to need some interior help. And that's where I go with this first pick, where Christian Haynes is my second guard in the class and was my first for a while until I determined that Graham Barton was a guard and not a tackle. Um, but that aside, Christian Haynes is really good. Um, I like him. He's not got the mauler mentality, but he's a really secure pass protector and... Um, you know, I think he fits that Cleveland offense very well and their their scheme with Nick Chubb. And hopefully Chubb bounces back. But if he doesn't, that's why we're going Jalen Wright, where Kareem Hunt was not good last year. J uh, Nick Chubb is coming off of a, a pretty bad injury. I mean, there's no way around it. It was a nasty injury. And uh, running backs are probably the most susceptible. Either running backs or, or corners are probably the most susceptible position to having an injury like that so as much as it sucks i mean really you know when your your cap's gonna be pretty bad soon and the, really the, may arguably your greatest weapon on our offense might not be himself after what happened i like jalen Wright. you know i think he fits that that browns offense and I, the first two picks here are very much run game oriented um but you know when you've kind of done all you can to to give Deshaun Watson the passing game. I mean, you you have Amari Cooper, you traded for Elijah Moore, um, you know, you've just traded for Jerry Judy and given him this big extension. You gotta, you gotta keep the run game up, uh, and this is our way of doing it through the draft. Gabe Hall in the fifth round after a little hiatus, um, because, you know, the Browns have two picks in the first uh, four rounds. Uh, Gabe Hall is a solid um, big eater of space who has pass rush upside but i don't ever believe will bank on it and will end up being just a solid depth piece in that defensive line uh, jamry chroma out of james madison sort of similar thing not not a similar player but sort of similar thing where this is a solid depth piece and you're just gonna need that because it's gonna be hard to keep uh, full rosters so you know kind of just again a lot of future oriented picks here but you know they did they did well last year with a lot of injuries so you're hoping you kind of step up this year uh tyrese knight the linebacker out of utep i you know just uh, sort of a filler pick you know but he, he's got some starting upside i like him in um uh what's his face yeah i'm having a bad day with um coordinator names today brown's defensive coordinator and i should know this uh is jim schwartz yes uh who will probably have a job next year but uh just giving jim schwartz some some solid pieces if he is still there um or whoever is there coaching that defense moving on to the dallas cowboys first pick i'm going lad mcconkey um you didn't have a lot of receiving help last year and it's kind of crazy to say that but uh, really when it mattered most the the receiving core just didn't step up and cd lamb is really good but he can't do it entirely on his own and you're adding a guy here with mcconkey who is open a lot you know i mean and that's about as much as you can do as a receiver you know you're not uh, a marvin harrison or a malik neighbors but you're a damn good receiver who knows how to get open and for a team who had issues last year where i mean it's just guys weren't open they didn't have you know the offense wasn't working uh go get yourself a you know deontay johnson i think is is a, a pretty good comp for him uh, if you just want to think of that in your offense uh and then following it up with zach frazier and braylon allen in the consecutive following picks where you've lost uh, tyler biotish and you have no running backs on the roster <laughs> i don't know who your starter is right now but it's it's not um it's not deuce vaughn um braylon allen i think makes a lot of sense here i think he fits the dallas offense and you pair that with Zach Frazier, who is, um, I, I really like him. You know, I don't know if I'd go high second round on him, but as kind of this uh, physical, he's just a physical guy. You know, there's some nice plays that he's made where really, I mean, if he, if he can take you down, he'll take you down. And I like that from, you know, a, a center where he's just got a, not a mauling 
you know, instinct, but just this, this want to dominate you and, um, you know, not, not to be <laughs> weird, but, uh, he, he wants to dominate you. He just does. He wants to throw you on the ground. And I like that in the center. So, you know, I, I think the, the following two picks, right, where you're, you're kind of trying to establish that ground game after keeping your receiving core up, you're, you're definitely going a certain way with the draft so far. And it continues when you take Delmar Glaze in the fifth round, where that's a lot more of a, a security blanket pick because we don't know, uh, what we're expecting from, a uh, Terry and steal after last year and um i don't know i mean there's there's a possibility you might end up keeping tyler smith at guard so you never know um, i like him here with dallas and then leonard taylor is is your attempt to to get someone on the defensive line where despite using a first round pick and having osa digizua it just wasn't a good unit and um you know they add someone here who's uh, not a <laughs> um not an immediate impact you know i don't know if he ever will be an impact but someone who, who's got some good size and you know miami does have uh, a certain type of player they like and you can expect you know at least something from them uh, and then tyler grubbs the linebacker from tulane is sort of a very much a flyer pick where he could be starting for you in three years he could also be off your team after this year you know so just one of those guys and then frank gore uh, junior from Southern Mississippi, and which I believe was Frank Gore Senior's school, um, is a solid little addition here. Where I was looking at it and like, dang, their running back room is still very thin. Uh, this is a late pick. Let's just take a solid running back here. Who uh, you know, there's going to be a lot of solid backs even at the end of the draft because it's just not. There's so much talent, but it's so lowly valued um, that you can find some pretty solid guys even here at the end. I do like Gore Junior. Moving on with the Broncos, um, at number 12, I went Dallas Turner. I didn't go quarterback until the sixth year because I, I really think if you're Denver right now, um, you just, you got to kind of take this next year to reset. I mean, you really, you really do. Um, you just need to kind of figure out who are your guys of the future uh, and who are you moving out on from. And I, I'm, I don't know if that's what they'll do in real life. I, I think Bo Nix is probably a Bronco, not at 12, but Bo Nix is probably a Bronco. So is that the approach they're going to take in real life? I don't know. In, in what I would do is in that scenario, let's take some high upside guys that fit your team well and you know could be pieces of the future and that starts with dallas turner who is about as high upside as he can get when it comes to pass rusher um i don't expect him to be you know like i guess i shouldn't have i shouldn't have said that the way i, I did because i'm not trying to emphasize that he's going to be like a miles garrett he's not a nick bosa um you know at best he's like a daniel hunter but heck daniel hunter is a really good player and uh, again i'm not comparing them uh i don't I don't know who my comp for Turner would be, but he's a, he's an athletic pass rusher, and you know that's what you want here is someone who's got that high upside, um, who has a great first step, and a very you know he's got a, an intelligible arsenal, you know for for being a high upside player in my opinion. So you know there's a lot of there's a lot of great stuff to love there. Not a second round pick, but in the third round you take Hunter Norzad out of Penn State. You lost Lloyd Cushenberry to the Titans. Uh, this is probably your center of the future. I didn't like Alex Forsythe that much, uh, and I, I definitely like Hunter Zordat, Norzad a lot more. I think he he kind of fits uh, the the Sean Payton run scheme, and you know I know Sean Payton's not known for his run, but like he fits that kind of. Uh, he's going to move a lot, and I think he he works with that. Dallin Holker out of CSU, who is a one-year wonder, but uh, the one year was really good, and it was after moving from like some small school I've never heard of, or maybe I have, I don't remember. But um, he had a good year at CSU, and I think uh, this is kind of one of those like, you know, take a hometown, no, he's not a hometown kid, but like take a kid from, you know, CSU's, you know, obviously here in Colorado, and um, I live in Colorado, by the way, which is why I said it like that, but taking that sort of hometown, you know, college kid and 
just someone who, you know, they're going to add tight end at some point in the draft. I think I like Holker just because um, he showed some really nice receiving upside this his one year at CSU. So, you know, if you can get that, I mean, like Greg Dolce just could be good. It's just that he's never on the on the field, uh, whereas Holker has never had any health issues as far as I'm aware. So Makai Wingo in the fifth round is a pretty good pickup. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a little lower on him than uh, most people, I'd say. But I think as, as kind of someone where the Broncos do have a really weak uh, defensive line and not a very good run stopping defensive line, he kind of checks both those boxes where he's just a solid guy to have in that rotation and he's a pretty solid run defender. Uh, and then Kyrie Jackson is kind of uh, in a way similar, but for the corner room where I don't expect him to ever be starting at any point, but you just feel a bit better with some you know better depth because the it's just a, a very flimsy room uh, aside from Pat Sertan. Jamari Thrash is is kind of one of those things where like most of these teams I give like a running back or a receiver to because I feel like you you kind of should add to your skill positions well um, every year in the draft at, at least once I think and so it's just kind of one of those picks where like uh, you know he's a solid player he was probably the best receiver available at that point I felt comfortable taking him and so I just you know he's, he I don't would he make the roster maybe not I don't know but you know you, you never know and uh, we have guys that get drafted in the fifth, sixth, seventh all the time that just like, okay, they're actually, they're, they're worth rostering. So uh, Jordan Travis is the quarterback that I ended up going with for the Broncos um, in the sixth round. Is he like a Sean Payton guy? No, but are you going to get a Sean Payton guy at the in, in the sixth round? No. And they just needed a, a quarterback, you know, because they, they don't even have a backup right now on the roster. So they at least have to take a guy. Um, I'm not taking him at all because I think he's going to start. I don't want him to start. Um, he is just simply a developmental backup that, you know, maybe is your backup going forward for whoever you do get to be quarterback. Um, but, you know, it's just, it's, it's to, it's to back up Jarrett Stidham, you know, who will be your starter next year, unless he's like really, really bad. Um, again, in real life, I, I think they probably go Bo Nix um, and he probably starts. But in this scenario, uh, you're just rolling with Jarrett Sidham for a year and you're figuring it out uh, next year when you have some money, uh, whether that's free agency because Dak Prescott's a free agent, uh, which not every Broncos fan is going to you know, be foaming at the mouth over, but um, whether it's that or the draft or whatever, but there's going to be better situations than trading up when you don't have a lot of capital or you know, taking Bo Nix, who's not a, a great quarterback for me. Here with the Lions at 29, I went with Darius Robinson, who's actually a Detroit native. So, I mean, that's always kind of fun when you get to kind of pair up a guy with, you know, a team that he grew up watching. Um, aside that, he fits them really well. You know, he's, he's kind of that... Um, He's an edge, but he's really more of like a strict three tech, in my opinion, where like, I don't want him standing up, uh, but I also don't want him as a defensive tackle. So, you know, I like him as kind of that, and that's kind of the way that the Lions use their pass rushers in a way. So just think of him as like a less, um, he's not Aiden Hutchinson, but like he's he's going to fill a similar role, um, though he's much less athletic. He's a lot more violent, and I, I'd be fine taking him in the first round, even though he's kind of more of a, a early second for me. But he fits really well here with Detroit. Mason McCormick is a guard out of Southern Dakota State who thankfully is finally getting some kind of higher recognition because this guy is probably going to be a second round pick. And I would be surprised if he's not a very good guard at the next level. Uh, why does he drop to 61 in that scenario? Well, this is a good class. I mean, that's, that's really about it. There's just a lot of great players here and good players are going to fall. There's going to be a, a decent amount of starters being picked in the second, third, maybe even fourth round here. So, um, and especially for the line, the, the offensive line class is great this year. So even though he's the 61st pick, I mean, this is a guy that, you know, would start, I think, day one over um, how to buy I think is his last name. Um, he's the one with the super long name. But uh, I like him there. DJ James, I think, really fits here with the Detroit defense. And um, another one of those guys where I've kind of had a weird journey with him. But I've actually grown a bit more fond of him than, you know, than a guy like Nehemiah Pritchett. Um, and I think he was better than Pritchett at Auburn. Bo Brady. I, I want to say it's Brady because I feel like Brady's wrong. But I, I think it's Brady. Um 
from Maryland is a pretty solid safety and nothing more. <laughs> and I, I wish I could give some more in-depth analysis, uh, but I don't want this video to take forever. And I, you know, I just, there's only so much I can say covering the base of these guys, but it's like I said earlier, if you're fifth beyond, I mean, it's like, yeah, you're some solid players with maybe some starting upside, uh, Bo Brady, you know, I, maybe he could start, um, since I don't like Efi to Melifonwu as much, but um, you know he's he's a solid player to get here in the fifth. Some good backup, a good backup at the very least. George Halani, I think, could uh, pair a really nice duo with Jameer Gibbs once David Montgomery is out the door. I like him. He's got this this nice. Um, he's got nice. What I'm trying to say, he he knows how to use his legs. Like he can he can make you miss really easily. Um, so I like him. Miles Harden, a cornerback out of South Dakota, who's this bigger body but also pretty athletic. And I, I like him here as kind of this just like flyer. You know, maybe makes the roster. Um, and then Evan Anderson, who is the other true nose tackle of this class. He is a big boy, uh, and I actually really want to see really quick what what he currently is. Um, height weight wise florida atlantic um as of right now he is well he's gone down to 319 so good for him but he's he's six feet tall um you know and at a point he i think he was like 340 or something so you know 340 is is pretty big to be when you're even when you're six feet tall uh he's still a big boy and uh you know we like we like big boys like uh, it's what i said about sweat earlier it's not to the same degree like he's not on the level of sweat or jordan davis at all but he's got a very specific role that um he might fill right he's he's in the seventh for me because i don't even know if i'm like a roster but um he's, he's the same role and type of player um with the packers here they got kool-aid at 25 and i feel like maybe we're starting to get some sort of uh prospect fatigue on kool-aid because we do have to remember, I mean, he was really good early on in his career at Alabama. And I, I really do think to a degree he's kind of been um, uh, coasting along, you know. And then you take into consideration the fact that he had a, a Jones fracture and didn't even know about it. Then you got to question, you know, how, how long has he had that and not known about it potentially. So then you look at this year where like maybe it, maybe it was coasting, but then you're like, well, what if he was hurt? Um I think, and, and then you take, when you take all that into consideration and, and look at the fact that he was still a first round player with, you know, at a point he had some crazy athletic ability, uh, not, not so much anymore, but again, he's been hurt and maybe coasting a bit. This could be a guy that, you know, when he gets to the league could turn into a really damn good corner. So at 25, you know, uh, maybe you're just getting a solid corner, but there's also the potential there that he could be much better than, than maybe advertised. Uh, Peyton Wilson in the second um, is a pick I really like here for Green Bay, who linebacking room is not the greatest right now. Um, they've got a couple of case starters, but like Peyton Wilson's really athletic. He's really good. I don't know what they're feeding dudes at NC State, but like they're feeding them good. Um, you know, Wilson, he's just, he's a, he, and he's big too. Like he's not a, a smaller linebacker for being as, for being as athletic as he is. Um, besides that, he's a, he's a brilliant run defender. I mean, he just reads gaps amazingly. So uh, this is a guy where like, I have him at 41. Um, I don't know if I ended up giving him, I'd have to go look now what my grade on, on him was. Um, but for a while I had a first round grade on him and I want to see if I still do because in my mind, I, I almost want to say no matter what you think he is. Um, I, so I have a second round grade on him uh, officially because I finalized my rankings. But like this is a guy I would not hate if a team took in the first. Like the Lions surprised people when they took Campbell in the first last year. I, you know, I, I understood it. I don't know if I would have gone that way. Wilson, if somebody wants to do that this year, fine by me. He's a phenomenal linebacking prospect, and I think he could be, you know, an, an all-pro type player. Uh, it's just that linebacker's very scheme-dependent, but I love his fit here with the Packers and Jeff Halfley. Uh, Blake Fisher is um, honestly probably starting for you, uh, even as a second rounder. I mean, remember what I said, this line class is very good. Fisher, it, it could start for you here. It, you know, I, I do like uh, Rasheed Walker, I wanna say is the Wake Forest guy. Um, I think it was Wake Forest or Penn State or whatever. Um, Rasheed Walker, I do like him, if that's who I'm thinking of. But uh, even at right tackle, you know, they've got, um, God, I'm, I'm forgetting names right now. 
the uh, they have the right tackle, right? But he's a guy that kind of goes into guard as well. And, you know, they lost Josh Neiman. Um, I think he went to the Panthers. Uh, path. Yeah, I think so. I don't know. I don't, I'm trying to keep track of everyone and, and everything. It's a lot of players. But um, regardless, you know, he could start at tackle. I, you know, maybe you switch the right tackle in and then you move Walker over. I mean, either way, I like uh, Fisher here for Green Bay. He'll probably end up starting. Cole Bishop is a, a, a fit that I loved. I think he, he's a, exactly what the Packers need at safety to pair up with Xavier McKinney. Um, you know, I know teams don't really use like free safety, strong safety much anymore, but I mean, it's, it's kind of as close to that as you can get in a way where where McKinney really does serve that free safety this this roaming over the top guy and then Bishop just kind of that more um, not a box safety but like just patrols that nickel area so well um, that it'd be a really nice combo there Rook Ororo I think it's how you say him it's it's Ororo um, is a pretty solid defensive tackle with some really nice athleticism who is probably not going to be an impact uh you know piece on the defensive line but could be a solid number two um with with one upside i'll say it you know i i, I just I, i'm a little in between on him i don't view him as as a, a starter within the first two maybe even three years of his career but like after that he could be you know i just don't think he's got the um the the traits you're looking for for like a starting uh tackle in in the that scheme that they're gonna run michael pratt is the guy i take to be the backup because they really do need a, a backup and he's probably um i mean i i i view Pe uh phoenix penix as a backup but like you know a lot of people don't among the guys who people actively view as like a backup player um pratt's my top guy and so for the packers here whose current backup quarterback is um sean clifford i think you know if michael pratt i think he fits him and i i like him there as the backup to jordan love and then they get tory taylor who's my top punter of the class i had the uh, Bengals taking austin mcnamara earlier um the only other punter here is tory taylor who is uh by far the best um you know, a punter in the class, very good leg, and he's also very accurate with his ball placement. So, you know, for a team who I don't even know who their punter is, like I, I generally know, you know, teams, kickers, punters, um, even long snappers, but like I've never heard of the Packers punter. So uh, they, they get their guy here. And then some just kind of depth pieces here at the end. You know, again, we've talked about these later guys. Braden McGregor, Michigan, you know, solid little... Um, maybe a, a rotational guy isaiah williams i mean they've got some guys similar to his skill set but like he could end up making the roster curtis jacobs i feel probably is most likely out of these last four to make the roster just because their linebacking room is weak and i, I do like the fit there and then brady latham you know kind of just a maybe you know but probably not gonna make the roster Moving on to the Houston Texans, uh, who do not have a first-round pick, but have two seconds. And with them, they use them on Mason Smith, who I think has become overlooked. And I'm not quite sure why people have kind of forgotten about him. Like, I still feel pretty confident that he'll be, like, a good defensive tackle at the next level. I don't know if he'll be an elite, but he'll be a good one. And getting that in the second round and then giving that to D'Amico Ryans next to Danico Autry and Daniel Hunter and Will Anderson. Yeah, why not? <laughs> um, and then you get Max Melton, who's this very athletic corner. His brother, Bo Melton, kind of had a back, uh, breakout at the end of last year with the Packers. And um, Max Melton is a similar player, even though he's a corner, um, because he's a very athletic guy and has this like slender build, but like doesn't act like it like sometimes slender guys you know can't get physical they can't go up and get it um i like max melton you know i think he'll be a, a good corner at the next level uh john morgan the third from arkansas is a solid pass rusher uh, it's another one of those where like the fit i don't know as much but because maybe i prefer him as more of a, a an outside backer and like a, a an odd front type but you know, I think Morgan, who is just more of the... he He's a really nice speed-to-power pass rusher. And 
so I, I like him, you know, just regardless, because I think the, that Houston get, can get some use out of him. And there's a there's a universe where he can learn from Daniil Hunter a little bit and uh, use that. Uh, Cedric Gray in the fourth, you know, they lost some linebackers to free agency this year. Uh, you get a guy who's kind of a, a solid fill-in. Um, if he doesn't start, he'll be a good backup. Tip Raymond who's a very good run blocking and just blocking in general tight end. You know, a, really a sixth lineman, kind of. He's, he's that good. So, um, you know, for the Texans here, where they've got a very strong roster, I'm kind of just, you know, give them, give them a good blocking tight end, right? Uh, and then the last picks, I mean, these guys probably don't make the roster aside from Peter Bowden because uh, the – I just said, oh, I know the long snappers. The Texans long snapper – I'm trying to remember the name of. Uh, it's been there a while and he's pretty old. So I gave them the one long snapper of the class who's like the only guy I would draft personally. The rest are kind of, you know, just get him in UDFA. Um, but this guy's pretty good in on um, special team situations and uh, he's just, he's consistent. So, but besides that, Charles Turner, you know, probably not going to make the roster, but like maybe, right? And then Marcus Rosemary Jack Saint, probably not going to make the roster, but maybe. And I, I, you know, I think he's probably the, the biggest threat because he does have some nice size to him and there's been some flashes at Georgia. Um, but then Jarrett Kingston, you know, I don't know. It's kind of a flyer pick. Like he could be, turn out to be a good backup, but like probably not. Uh, then with the Colts and uh, I went Brian Thomas here because, you know, I, lo I love the idea of just adding all these freaks to this offense where you have Anthony Richardson, who's maybe the freakiest quarterback, at least the freakiest since Cam. And, you know, you, you have um, Jelani Woods, who's this this giant dude. You have um, Michael Pittman Jr. And now you're adding Brian Thomas Jr., who is this just, he, he's, he's pretty good at going up and getting it downfield. You know, I mean, it's, it's, kind of hard to pass up on a guy where like you just you feel comfortable that if you're your really good shifty running back is is not involved or whatever and your quarterback's contained and Michael Pittman Jr. is isn't open and Jelani Woods isn't open well you can probably just chuck it up to Brian Thomas and Anthony Richardson has the arm to do it so you know I just it's it'd be fun uh Kamari Lassiter I think really fits the Colts defense that Gus Bradley system um you know he's a bit slower but I mean it's probably not a friendlier system to slower corners than um Gus Bradley so you know I think that really benefits him more than anything because he's going to be able to use that that physicality that he does bring in the game and he's a very willing run defender Zach Zinter, a guard out of Michigan, probably starts over Will Fries. Um, I, I don't know if it's Fries or Freeze. I call him Fries. Um, but Zach Zinter, you know, probably starts over him because Zach Zinter, and I just like that name, is a pretty good guard who has some, uh, you know, upside stuff to work on in the run game. But as a pass blocker, I really like him. Tommy Eichenberg in the fourth is a solid little get here because they don't have a third linebacker. Um, to my knowledge right now, I, they have Franklin and, um, other dude that I can't remember the name of, but, uh, Leonard was, was not as good anymore and is obviously gone and, uh, O'Kara Kay's in New York. So, uh, you get yourself, uh, probably a solid, you know, linebacker here that, you know, I think starts, but it's not going to be like a great player. Theo Johnson in the fifth feels like good value. Um, but you know, he's, again, I think he'd, he'd fit best as like that tight end to, um, to Jelani Woods and, um, it's, he'd serve it well. DeAndre Prince is kind of the opposite of, of Lassiter, where he's a bit more of this like athletic, uh, smaller bodied corner, but you know, you can't have all a bunch of slow corners and stuff. And I, you know, I just like him here. And then Jevion Cohen is kind of another one of those flyers where like he could end up being good depth, but probably not. He's he just never really developed in my at Miami and you know, just never became much. Here with the Jaguars, um, they're probably going to go corner, and I agree with that decision, and I really hope it's Terry and Arnold, because that'd be a phenomenal fit with um, Chris Richards and that scheme he's bringing with him from Atlanta, previously New Orleans, and, uh, you know, I think you're looking at a, an elite corner there, 
to to play across from uh, Tyson Campbell. So and and if you can make Tyson Campbell a number two instead of a number one, then that's even better. Uh, Keon Coleman, a big body receiver with some insane uh, reach to him, but is a guy that you know I I think became a little overrated because people got infatuated with those amazing highlight plays of his, but. You don't evaluate guys off of highlights, and once you really go into his tape, I mean, it's just he's just not you know a first round guy. He's um, someone who I think will will be like a you know best case he's a low end two. I really do think, but like worst case he's a high end three. I feel very confident that he'll be kind of uh, you know a, a safe option. If you have a, a tough receiving room, and if you don't have a tough receiving room, then he's a really good three or four to have, you know, so. Uh, and then Roger Rosengarten is kind of like a, we don't know what's going on with tackle right now pick. Like Cam Robinson's had issues with both health and off the field stuff. And, you know, Anton Harrison was not good last year, unfortunately. And we knew he was more of a developmental pick, but like he just wasn't good. Um, and then Walker Little, like he's been there for how long now, but like never really taken over as a starter at any point when he has played it's not been that impressive uh whereas rosen garden is is hopefully kind of just that like stabilizing piece where he is not going to be a, a great or elite tackle but i feel pretty good that he's not going to be a bad tackle and um you know you just it's that stabilizing piece where like if harrison is is bad again next year or if you know both both little can't start or robinson's hurt or you know whatever there's a lot of stuff going on in the tackle room um Ros rosengarten's hopefully that you know kind of stabilizing piece Jaden hicks is someone i'm a little lower on than others um i've seen safety one i don't i don't uh i don't know where that's coming from i didn't when i watched him i didn't get the sense that this was a guy that was anything more than like you know uh, a, spe a specific fit and I really like the fit here with the Jaguars. Like, I think he fits really well um, as kind of like an Andrew Wingard replacement. Um, but I didn't see him as anything more than like a, a, a very specific um, player that could be good in said specific scheme. Um, so I just, I guess I didn't get safety one because even in a good scheme for him, like even with the Jaguars here where I think he fits really well, he's still, you know, a, a solid safety in my opinion. Um, Michael Hall Jr., who is another one of those guys where like, I'm just, you know, not quite as high on, but, um, and, and just because I'm not as high on a player, you know, doesn't mean that I, I don't like them. It's just, I don't see them quite to the view of other people. And it's a similar thing here where like, I don't see the round two, round three stuff on Michael Hall, but I feel good taking him here in the fourth as like this athletic um, developmental type of pass rusher. But like, I'm also not too confident he's going to develop into anything more than like a develop or I keep saying developmental. Um, I'm not too confident he's going to develop into anything more than a rotational guy. Uh, and then you get Nick Gargu Gargiulo. Um, that's my that's my that's my attempt <laughs> um, from South Carolina, and I'm, I, maybe I'm just bad at pronouncing names, but uh, he's a solid center, you know, from from Carolina. This physical guy, a, a good run blocker, but you know, not much to talk about as a pass protector. Um, you know, you you got your center uh, spot filled out for right now with Mitch Morse, but uh, I would like this pick, you know, as kind of a, a developmental like. Could he be a replacement for for um, Mitchell? Yeah, I don't know. I just forgot his name. I just said it. I think unless I was saying the wrong name, um, Mitch Morse, not not Mitchell. Mitch Morse, uh, if he can be a replacement for him, you know, in a year or two, uh, I like the pick there. Jordan Whittington. I think fits really well with Doug Peterson's offense, and I I would feel pretty good about him as like a safety blanket as well, where like he could be your receiver four three, even though he's in the sixth round. So I think that's a solid pickup. And then Tyler Davis, uh, who's kind of like this athletic, um, well, athletic for the position, but like is he much else not really um and then kansas city chiefs and i sound a little like final on that because i am gonna record this in two this is still the whole mock draft but i'm probably gonna record this in two parts so this is it for me because my voice is starting to go but uh at 32 i took malik washington who i really like i feel pretty good that he's gonna be like you know 
at the worst, at the worst, a really good number three. Um, but I think he's a two. You know, he, he's not going to be a number one. But he, I think he's a two. And you know, being that Rasheed Rice is now probably going to jail because he, you know, was not doing smart things. Uh, you need a guy to kind of replace that skill set in a way they're not uh super similar players but like you know when you've you've signed marquise brown so you've got kind of your um you've got kind of your tandem here with with washington and brown where like admittedly they're not super um different in skill sets like they're they're smaller receivers but at the same time like washington also uses certain things to his advantage much better He's, he's just a much better, like, um, at the catch point and stuff than Brown. So I wouldn't be surprised if he ends up better than Brown, even here in year one with Kansas City. And, uh, you know, for, for the 32nd pick, if he can get a, a number one receiver, uh, when you just won the Super Bowl without a number one receiver, um, you know, Malik Washington's a pretty good pickup, in my opinion, there. I like him. Tyler Guyton is someone I like, like, late second. I Another one of those guys where, like, I just, the first round stuff, I don't get it. Um, I get that he's, he's very athletic. He's not even that athletic. I guess that's what I don't get is um, I think he's fine as someone that you take, you know, like middle day two as like he could be a starter for us next year or maybe the year after. Um, but even if he does become a starter, he'll be fine. You know, I, he's just he's not that athletic and he's he's had, you know, four years and he's worked with some good coaches at Oklahoma. So it's just like, I don't know necessarily if he's going to improve all that much by going to the NFL. He's not that athletic. So I guess I just don't see the high upside there. This feels like a, you know, maybe he's starting for us. And just because the Chiefs don't have a very good tackle room, I mean, it, it makes sense for them. And I like the pick and they know how to develop players, which is also why I went with TJ Tampa in the third round, because I just trust them to develop these types of guys where like, you know, I, I just I don't know if TJ Tampa's for a lot of teams because he's um, he's a physical slower corner, and so like he would be great with like again like the Colts for example, but like here with Kansas City he fits, um, which is one of the other teams where you know you take these certain types of corners and they, and they made guys uh, like Legarius Sneed really good, and Legarius Sneed's now one of the better corners in the NFL. So they, they just they know how to develop these guys. They know how to get the best out of them. They know how to get them to use their skill sets to their full potential. So that's why I like Tampa here. Hopefully you can turn him into like he's not like Legarius Sneed, but that type of player, right? Uh, in the fourth, getting Kamani Vidal out of Troy, who is this this nice little um i don't know i don't know why i like making like little things up for running backs but like you know this guy's a bullet this guy's a, a whatever with vidal here he's kind of like a uh, like a little ping pong ball in a way uh and and you know i think as a backup to pacheco i mean you're looking at two guys who um can just really you go get the first down. I mean, they're just, they're good at that. Jordan McGee, another one of those guys similar to Guyton Tampa where like, you know, I think um, this is a guy I feel comfortable taking here just because I trust that Steve Spagnuolo uh, would know exactly how to use him because there is a, an upside there where he becomes like a solid linebacker similar to like, you know, how um, uh, Nick Bolton, I think. I mean, the thing in uh, Bolton or Gay, but uh, similar to them, the, whichever one it was that left, I think it was Gay. Uh, Zion Tupiola, Tupiola Fatui is someone that has been around for forever, and he just had injury issues and stuff with COVID and a lot of stuff. And, you know, it just, after you've been at Washington for so long, and at, it's it's not a necessarily a bad thing to have played for so long and whatever um when you're like a lineman right where like tread on the tires isn't as much of a thing when you've done that and then you've not really shown any true progression like this is once again we're like i'm sure the chiefs are going to get the best out of him but when you've not shown the progression it's just like yeah I, I think this is a guy that like some team like the chiefs will take you know later on in the draft turn him into like a solid depth guy um, and then Deshaun Gaddy is not like that. You know, he's just one of those, like, more athletic late-day guys where um, I'm a fan of him. You know, I, th I hope some team takes a pick on him, but I don't know if he'll get drafted. Um, just, you know, so I think there's some upside there to potentially make a roster.
And then kicking the second half off here, uh, for the Vegas Raiders at 13, I'm going Quinion Mitchell, who is this physical, very scheme versatile, just all around great defender. Um, he'd go a lot higher in a lot of other classes. I mean, I don't know if he's on like Sauce Gardner levels of prospect, but this is a guy that I expect to definitely be a very good corner at the next level, and getting him at 13 is really damn good value. At 44, I went with Jonathan Brooks, who, if not for hurting his leg, you know, would would definitely be a lot more um, commonly running back one in this class. He's running back two for me, uh, just because, you know, Trey Benson is about as good, but doesn't have the injury issues. Whereas with Brooks, I mean, you know, he'd probably be running back one, if not for, for the injury. And I just, it's one of those things where like leg injuries are tough on running backs and it's really tough to say, you know, um, if and when he'll get back to the level he was playing at, at Texas, which was a really good uh, running back, you know? And so this is kind of one of those where like, the, the Raiders running back room is pretty scarce right now, and uh, this is definitely sort of a, not a swing for the fences pick, but like, it's it's an upside thing, you know, where um, you're aware of the fact that this guy um, might potentially not be, you know, as good as he was just because of that injury, but um, if he is, you know, or he gets back to it even if after a year or whatever, um, you've got a really good running, running back on your team now. Um, and then Caden Wallace, the tackle out of Penn State, is a player that I like here for Vegas, um, replacing uh, Jermaine Illuminor at the right tackle position, and I think he could do it. I think he could start day one. So, again, getting a third uh, a starter in the third round. Uh, Jalen McMillan, who's this really good speed threat from Washington, has kind of become a little under the radar because of uh, Roma Dunze and Jalen Polk. But, uh, he, you know, being the third best receiver at Washington isn't that big of a, a downplay because he's a really good speed threat and in his own right uh, definitely has a place in the NFL as kind of a, a, an elite wide receiver three, I think. Uh, Jalen Harrell out of Missouri. You know, I, I like the fit here. I think he really fits Antonio Pierce's defense. Um, it's just more, you know, he's not the... He just doesn't have too many elite traits. You know, he doesn't have an elite get off. He doesn't have crazy athleticism or anything. He's he should just be a solid pick to add some someone to the uh, kind of edge room out there with Vegas. Anthony Goodlow uh, from Oklahoma State is a similar thing, right? I, I think he, you know you feel good that he, he might make the roster, um, but you're not expecting much else than like a good backup at best. Uh, and and same, it's kind of the same way I feel about Oladapo as well. Where uh, again, this is a guy that a lot of people are really high on and i'm just not i you know i'd see him as a, a backup at the next level so we'll see right and, and of course I'm, I'm not gonna be right on all these if if i don't i shouldn't have to say that but like i'm not gonna be exactly accurate on on even near at all these players um if even half of them right so who knows right oladapo could end up being a great safety um i just don't see it personally i think he's a backup um and then richard Jubinor from uh troy is kind of this like um this flexible linebacker edge like i think he's got the skill set to play edge but he's just he's a little small for it so he's he'd, he'd be a really good blitzing linebacker um and again just kind of adding some pieces to the, the defense there with him harold goodlow and uh you already took uh, mitchell at the first round so you know just adding some really nice pieces to a defensively coached team with the chargers at number five i'm going malik neighbors who uh, at the very start of the video, you know, I said he is really neck and neck with Marvin Harrison for me, and this is not a, a consolation prize. It's just not. You know, he is an, a, an extremely good receiver with arguably more of a modern skill set than Marvin Harrison, and he just fits wherever he goes. It doesn't matter where he goes. He'll he'll fit them, and he'll fit what they're trying to do because the, uh, the NFL is mainly trying to mimic the offenses of, like, Kyle Shanahan and, and uh, Mike McDaniel right now. So neighbors who fits that really well, like, you know, the, the dream scenario for a team is if, if, as if someone like Miami could somehow get their hands on a guy like neighbors. I mean, you're just talking about maybe the, the scariest offensive, you know, field that we've ever seen. Um, so for the chargers here who need a receiver, uh, you know, I, I don't think it's a bad pick. Uh, and then Mike Sane Restrill in the second round is a really really good slot you know it's i just don't think slots are worth picking in the first round um but if there was ever a slot that you were going to take in the first round this would probably be it and i wouldn't be too mad at it because you know like i said he's he's 
got his role, but he's very good at it. And he played it very well at Michigan. And you know that uh, Harbaugh's going to go after these Michigan guys. Um, and, you know, I, I bet you in real life, they'll probably end up getting Corum at some point, like probably in the four. The pick that I took Isaac Glorando, I know I'm skipping out a little bit, but the pick I took Isaac Glorando is like probably where they'll take Corum. Um, if not at like 105, I, I feel like 69 is a little rich. But um, speaking of 69, we got Cooper Beebe from Kansas State, who is this solid run blocking guard. And that just is a John Harbaugh alignment, if I've ever heard one, uh, or Jim Harbaugh. I don't know if I've been saying John, Jim. Uh, Jared Wiley, I really like as a fit for this Chargers offense. Um, I believe they signed... Um, I wanted to say Colby Parkinson, but I'm pretty sure he went to the Rams. Um, I'm not sure what the Chargers did at tight end this offseason. Um, did they bring back Gerald Everett? Um, no, that Will Disley is the Seahawks tight end I was thinking of, and Hayden Hurst. So, yeah, I mean, I, I like this kind of here as a, as a trio with those three. I think he fits with them very nicely. And honestly, like, I, it's not crazy to think he could end up being your tight end one because uh, he is a really talented guy and, you know, he's, he's good value at 105. And then Isaac Guarendo is kind of like one of the sleepers of the class for sure. Um, I don't know if he'll get picked higher than this just because he's a running back, but uh, I expect Guarendo to end up being, um, you know, a low end starter at least in the NFL. He's got some really nice athletic skills to him. And so, like, I know they'll probably go Corum to be their running back, but like I like Grendo a lot, and I think he'd fit maybe even better. Uh, Tarheeb Steele is is I think that's how you say it. it might just be still is one of my guys in the class, and like even though I've got him in the fifth round, I think that's probably still way higher than a lot of people have him um, because I think he's got some nice upside to him, and you know he's not going to be much more than like at the worst a low, very low end starter. Um, or at the best, a very low-end starter, but I like him as a developmental backup. Uh, Jalen Ford from Texas is kind of this big-bodied uh, physical guy and gets involved in the run game, but as a pass, you know, protection guy or uh, pass coverage guy, he's not all that much. Uh, Satoa Lumen Lumea? Um, from from Utah, kind of a filler pick in a way, you know, just maybe he'll make the roster. And then Keaton Slovis is just kind of some friendly competition to Max Duggan, uh, trying to get your, or Dugan, uh, trying to get your best backup quarterback to uh, Mr. Herbert because, um, you know, Easton Stick, I think it was who started for them last year, and he, he, was, uh, he was okay, but, you know, you probably want a little bit more from a backup. And then sticking in LA, we've got the Rams, who if 19 Leatu Latu is still there, you're taking Leatu Latu because he's a really good fit. You keep him in town. You need a pass rusher of his caliber. And while he might not have the athletic or elite like athletic traits of uh, Dallas Turner or the great first step, um, he doesn't have a bad first step by any means. And he is a extremely technically gifted pass rusher um, who I think would just do wonders for the Rams here who kind of need a, a new premier guy on the front five, front seven. Uh, Bo Nix in the second round might not be a pick a lot of Rams fans like. Um, the truth you have to accept is that Stafford is, is an older quarterback and he's not getting younger. And I don't really think they have a plan at quarterback right now. And so a lot of the times in most classes, you're not going to have guys like Bo Nix, you know, who, who are available at the end of the second round that realistically, if under a year of, of Stafford and McVay, um, could, could totally be your starter, you know, once Stafford steps down, um, like, I think he fits very well because, like, there's a reason people talk about him going to Sean Payton so much. I mean, this is a guy that just perfectly fits that offense of, you know, he, he will just, he get the play done. You know, he's not going to make a, a bunch of big stupid mistakes. You know, he's, he's not going to wildly overthrow guys. Um, you know, maybe you can say his arm strength is lacking a little bit, but like he just, he operates the offense at an efficient and successful level. And I think that's, that's exactly what you want if you're Sean McVay um, versus going back to the well of like, you know, maybe in a year or two, you're trying to draft like some high traits guy. Um, whereas if you can just take this guy in the second round, give him a year to develop, or maybe two years to develop, and then you I think you feel pretty good about him starting when Stafford is gone. Uh, Kalen Bullock is interesting because it, it really feels like he lost a step in a way here at, at this last year at USC, where, you know, before I thought he was, you know, maybe the best kind of free-roaming safety in the class, but just, you know, I, like I said, he just lost a step, and, you know, I've kind of just... I'm viewing him more as just like a general safety now, not a box, not a free roaming, just, just, you know, a safety. But I guess a lot of teams have him as a corner. I don't 
quite see that. Like he'd still be a safety for me. Um, but you know, there's still upside there because he used to, he used to be like really, really athletic and good at, at USC. And I don't know what happened this year, but um, you know, it could be a really good get for the LA Rams there. And then taking Karan uh, Amagaji is how I'm going to say it from Yale, who is kind of just like a solid um, developmental guy who, you know, could be your starter in a year or two, maybe even as a rookie. But I don't know if, if that'd be the best option. But, uh, you know, he's a guy who, like, I, I feel pretty good that will be a, a starting tackle at some point. Just needs a bit of a time. Uh, Keenan Stewart, a... Um, an unlikely attempt to replace Aaron Donald, but uh, you're gonna need some someone, you know, through the draft on that defensive line now. Um, you know, maybe you go that at 19, but I I don't think Brock Bowers is gonna be there, and if he is, that's a great pick, or not Brock Bowers, um, Byron Murphy. But um, yeah, so Keenan Stewart kind of trying to replace that. Cam Little, kicker from Arkansas, is my top kicker in the class. Um, it wasn't a good year last year kicking for for the Rams. It was. Um, it was uh, the old Broncos kicker for a little bit. Um, oh, well, he was on the Broncos before he went to the Rams. Brett Maher, um, who wasn't good, and then I think Tanner Brown kicked a little bit, and he wasn't very good. So you're getting the best kicker in the class. Um, J.D. Bertrand, just kind of a, a depth piece at linebacker. Keelan Robinson, I feel like, fits the Sean McVay offense, so he's a good little get here in the sixth round. Uh, they have a lot of late later picks, you know, with Josh Newton, uh, Corn from TCU, again, kind of a, a depth stash pick. Luke McCaffrey is someone who I think could work pretty well in Sean McVay's offense, so, you know, it's, it's worth taking him here at this point, um, but I don't know if he's, like, the most talented receiver in the world, just, you know, I think he, he could fit farewell is in a scheme that benefits him. KT Leviston being the last pick for the Rams, who is, again, kind of just a, a stash, like maybe he makes the roster. Uh, moving on to the Dolphins, who have a shorter draft. I went Graham Barton at 21, who is, you know, kind of the, the definition of versatile, where truly he can play left tackle, he can play left guard, he can play center, he can play right guard, he can play right tackle. He could genuinely play any of them, and he, he'd be better the farther inside he goes, in my opinion. Um, I do have him as a guard primarily so I think that's probably where you play him if you're Miami but um, you know he can play tackle and he can play center so you know it's nice to have that versatile guy on the line where you know you're, you're kind of uh, your lines in a weird place right now and then going to the other side of the line you get Brandon Dorless who is this pretty athletic for for the position and, and for his size but he you know he's a big guy who can run and I think he's gonna be an impact player at the next level um, probably as you know a starting defensive tackle here for the Dolphins um, who can kind of kick outside as well to like a three tech which is maybe where he's best but i like him um in anthony weaver's defense is kind of a, a defensive tackle chris abrams drain slot from missouri you know he's got the he's got the ability to go outside um but he's definitely more of a slot than he is an outside boundary corner um I, you know i'm not the biggest fan of him but uh he's he's just a solid get here in the fifth round you know he could potentially start for you if not this year the next year uh, jacob cohen from uh, arizona is a solid receiver to get at the end here i said earlier i just think it's a good idea to get you know skill position at least once in every draft and then andrew rame from oklahoma who you're looking at as you know a backup um you know i think he'd make the roster just because i don't know who their backup center is right now um yeah, but there's a universe where he starts even, and that's, you know, if you can get a starter in the seventh round, then cool. With the Minnesota Vikings, um, their two first rounders, I went Jaden Daniels and Jared Verse. Now, Jaden Daniels is my quarterback four. And to be completely honest, I'm not... I'm not very sure of him being a successful quarterback at the next level. There's a few too many inconsistencies with, you know, across the field mainly. Um, but he's got a really nice deep ball and he has good accuracy. And I think he can run, um, 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 I can't remember his first name, O'Connell, Kevin O'Connell's offense well enough. Um, I really think it would benefit him if if this is the way they ended up going somehow to to sit him for a year under Sam Darnold because I really think he could use a year of learning um, the playbook of wherever he goes. And to be honest, I'm, I'm a little uh, fearful for him going to Washington this year because I, I just don't think he's a guy that's ready to start and he's going to have to this year. Um, if you're Minnesota here, you're really, you, for the future, I don't know if you want him to start him this year. And then you get Jared Verse, who is a perfect fit with Brian Flores and his blitz-heavy scheme, where Flor or Verse is, is just a guy who uh, will bull rush you to hell, and he's not going to lose. 
uh, more times than he wins. So, you know, he's just he's a good get here, right? You you know what you're getting out of him. He's not going to be this um, elite. I, well, some people view him that way, but I, he's not going to be this elite, um, you know, top pass rusher and everything who's like feared. But he is going to be a really good situational pass rusher and you know someone that is you know a two three down player even um, who can who get back who can get back there. But he's just you know doesn't have much to his game outside of the fact that he is a very powerful guy. Um, in the fourth, they take Audric Estime, who is you know your your new two for Aaron Jones, who. I think fits really well with with uh, Aaron Jones' estimate, where you know Jones is more of this bouncy back. You know he he likes to get outside a bit more. Estimate just give him give it to him up the middle. I mean he's gonna make get some yards. You know, and he's he's not as unathletic as some people think. Like he didn't have the greatest performance at the combine, but like you know that's not always a true tell of of on field athleticism because a lot of guys you know they they perform better at the combine than they are an actual athlete on the field. Kind of the opposite for estimate where. He's actually a better athlete on the field than he showed at the combine. So I'm not really worried at all about his testing numbers. I mean, he, you know, I feel good that he's a, a chain back and that he'd be a very productive number two. Brandon Coleman from TCU, who kind of has tackle versatility, but you're definitely taking him as a guard if you're Minnesota. Um, does he start? I don't know, but you know he could be a starter in the future, and at the very least, he's very good depth to get here. Javon Baker is someone that I know I'm lower on, um, but I, I don't think he's much more than like a KJ Osborne role, right? Where he's he's a, a, a middle of the pack um, wide receiver three. You know, I, he can serve as a two, I guess, but preferably not. So, you know, I, I feel like this is right for him, replacing KJ Osborne. Jerry and Jones, um, slot from FSU. He is a smaller corner for sure. He doesn't get involved in the run game as much as you'd like, but he, he's a solid, you know, just in general pass coverage. Um, as a slot, he works well enough. Logan Lee from Iowa is a big boy, big farm kid, and I like those kinds of players, but, you know, he doesn't have the... Um, he doesn't have the toolbox. He doesn't have um, insane athleticism. You know, he's not really an edge, but, like, he's in a way built like an edge, and he doesn't play like it. So it's kind of a tough one. I think he's going to fall a little bit, but, like, if he were to go to the right team, and, and I don't know if Minnesota's necessarily the right team, but, like, if he were to go to the right team, get, get the right coaching, I think he could be kind of on, you know, like a... Um, I'm trying to think of a, a comp for him, but um, he, he could be on the level of guys like, you know, um, Carl Lawson, right? You know, maybe not prime Carl Lawson, but uh, then Mayan Williams, double dipping at running back, but your running back room's pretty scarce after Jones right now. I think Jones, Estime, and Williams make up for a really nice running back room. So if you are putting Jaden Daniels on there, you know at the least you're going to have a really good run game and that that's going to that's gonna help him, right? Because if you have Justin Jefferson and Jordan Addison and, um, you know, Javon Baker out there and you have Jaden Daniels who can take off on a win, but then you also have Aaron Jones and Mayan Williams and Audrey Estime and you've got a really good line, um, I, you know, I did say Daniel should sit for a year, and I still believe that, but, like, you're putting him into a really good situation, which is exactly what he needs um, when he is ready to start. And then Elijah Jones is kind of a flyer pick. Like, you know, he's probably not going to make a roster. New England Patriots. We finally get to my number one player in the class, which is Joe Alt. For me, Joe Alt is... Um, I said earlier in the video I don't like to throw out the word generational. I wouldn't even do it for Caleb Williams or Marvin Harrison. Joe Alt is a generational player to me because I feel like it's it's only so very often that you get a tackle prospect of this caliber where you, I just I purely feel very confident that he will be a Hall of Famer someday. And I know that Patriots fans want to go quarterback, and I get that. But when it comes down to would I rather have J.J. McCarthy slash Jaden Daniels or Joe Alt, if it's what I would do, which is what this mock is, I'm taking Joe Alt 10 days out of 10 because, um, like I said, I feel pretty confident and there's not a lot of players you can say that about that he will wear a gold jacket someday. So when you can secure your left tackle position potentially for the next, you know, 15 years maybe um, with, with 
I, who I think will end up going down as an all-time great. Like that's how good he really is because he's he's this big. I mean, he's elite in both the pass and run game. Um, he's just got the whole package. Like, really, I, it's it's just the only thing that can make him better is if he was like maybe a bit more athletic. But he's not unathletic. He's he's a very good player. At 34, Xavier Leggett from South Carolina. You know, not the best at creating separation, but he's he's able to go up and get it. I like his ability to to create after the catch, so I, I like him here for New England, who needs a receiver. And then they they get their quarterback, but like not of the future really, with Michael Penix, who I view as a backup. You know, I think this is a guy where like if he's there at 68, then I'm fine taking him because you can at least see what he's got. Because you never know. I mean, we have we have guys who aren't first round players all the time, and it just turns out like. For, you know, maybe it's the scheme or maybe it's the playbook or whatever it is, but like this guy's much better than we thought. So uh, it's at least interesting to see like, okay, what does he have, right? Could he be our quarterback of the future? And I do think he fits with um, Andrew Van Pelt in his offense. So I, I like that there. Cam Hart in the fourth is a um, bigger, you know, not as big as we thought at Notre Dame, but a bigger corner who has been a little up and down. And I think I settled on him as kind of this early day three guy where there's definitely some upside there, but like there's also a lot of red flags on tape. Of just like he's, you know, being that he's a bigger guy, he's not the most athletic. He's not as fast as you'd like. Um, and it doesn't necessarily always bring the physicality that I then want if he's not going to be that fast. Dominique Hampton in the fifth, I think is good value because I really think he could be looking at a guy who's uh, potentially starting for you at safety in a couple years, maybe three, um, someone who's going to need some development, but like at the very least, I think you're getting a good backup. Joshua Gray from Oregon State is kind of um, someone I was a little underwhelmed on. And uh, again, I think a lot of people have him way higher than this. I'm not one of those people. Um, he's just, I don't know, he's not, there wasn't anything special to me. I think he'd, he'd be fine as like a late pick for you know some depth or whatever uh javante jean baptiste from notre dame i think fits the jared gerard mayo very good uh i can't speak he fits the gerard mayo defense very well and he's kind of that matthew judon replacement of ways and then lastly joshua cardi who is gonna you know be taking on chad ryland because even though ryland had his moments um for the most part he was pretty poor last year and i like cardi so he's these the other uh kicker worth drafting in my opinion uh there's three of them so it, i'd say the my least favorite of the three but worth drafting so you know i got cardi here from the patriots with the new orleans saints i went mims at 14 i feel pretty good that they're going to go offensive line um and I, you know, I, I, I hope it's Mims because I really like the fit there. And I think he, you know, as a developmental, like he's not raw, you know, it's just that he's had these weird circumstances and injuries have affected him, but like, not really, you know, like he's not an injury prone, prone player. He's not, um, he's not someone you're concerned about health wise. It's just like, okay, let's finally get him out on the field. You know, it's, it's not always been injuries. And so for a guy who is big, and not not a great run blocker but like in pass blocking he's pretty dang good already and a lot of people you know would call him raw again i wouldn't but it's just the fact that he's not played that much there's a lot more to his game left to be unlocked and so i really like that for the saints who need a tackle because ram checks dealing with health issues penning's not been good in the second round, grabbing Edrin Cooper, linebacker from Texas A&M. I think he fits. Um, he, he kind of has a similar style to Demario Davis, who is getting up there in age now, especially for a linebacker, so potentially your Davis replacement. Gabriel Murphy. There's a bit of a hiatus here, and then they have a bunch of picks in the fifth. Um, first being Gabriel Murphy from UCLA, who I think fits that Saints defensive end style of player, um, kind of just a you know depth piece most likely. Tyler Owens, a very athletic safety from Texas Tech, getting a guy back there in that room who, you know, just brings some new athleticism to it, probably not starting for you. Um, Talia Tangabailoa from Maryland, I think fits um, with the uh, San Francisco offense that's coming over in, um, oh God, I always forget this guy's name. Um, either way, the Saints are now running a Shanahan style offense, and I think Tunga Vailoa um, fits that. You know, I like him as as kind of that backup to Carr, and like you know, maybe next year you're gonna.
have him in a similar situation to like a Jarrett Stidham or a, a Sam Darnold where you might be taking a year to evaluate like, okay, what do we have here with Tunga Bailoa? Um, and then, you know, he's not a starter. I don't think he's going to end up like surprising people and being their starter or whatever. Um, but, you know, he'd just he'd be a solid backup. Trevor Keegan from Michigan, I view as a guard, can also play tackle, some more offensive line help. Dylan Loeb from New Hampshire. I think it brings a nice element to the room that the running back room that just, you know, it's, it's sort of lacking right now. Like Jamal Williams, you know, um, he, he was a touch, touchdown monster in Detroit, was really able to, to get it in there. I mean, pretty much every time they gave it to him. Uh, it's just not been the same story with New Orleans. I don't even know if they use him the same way Detroit did. And Kamara's, you know, been on a, a bit of a decline slowly. So Loeb, who's this kind of, in a way, high upside guy, um, but, you know, it would probably be a two in the NFL um, here for some nice spice to the room. Thomas Harper, who I list as DB, because really he's he's one of the more versatile uh, defensive backs in this class. Truly can play safety, can play corner, can play slot, nickel, whatever. Um, so just a nice get for the defensive backfield. And then Ryan Flournoy from Southern Eastern Missouri State, who is kind of, you know, just my... my uh, I said it earlier with Bub Means, right? How there was like, he, there's a few guys in this class that I'm just like, you know, <laughs> I want him uh, to get a shot at the NFL. And this is another one of them with Flower Noy, who's from a, a smaller school, but has some really um, interesting, you know, measurables and, and stuff that I'd like to at least for some team to check out. He'll definitely get a camp invite um, at the very least. With the Giants here, who also have a bit of a shorter draft. I went Brock Bowers at six. I know a lot of people would want to go um, Odunze there, but uh, Bowers is not just a tight end, and that's something I want people to, to try and get over is that uh, I get that I list him as tight end. He is a tight end. But he's not just a tight end. He's, he's really a big slot. And um, for a Giants team that is devoid of receiving talent, you know, I, I get people want, want a Dunze, but Bowers just feels a bit more like a reliable target for me. Someone that Daniel Jones can truly just have as like a safety blanket near every play. Uh, he's a very good tight end. And I think uh, Arthur Smith has done irreparable damage to the name of, of tight ends because when you use them correctly, they can be really good when they have that kind of promise. We talked about David. David Njoku, how he never got things going. When they finally started using him and utilizing his skill set, all of a sudden he's a top 10 tight end. And so I think if they just, you know, Brian Dable, um, he knows how to use tight ends. Like, I think you just have to use him a similar way to how you used him Dawson Knox and Buffalo. I mean, I think you're looking at a very good tight end here for, for the Giants and also Darren Waller's contemplating retirement. Uh, Tyler Newbin in the second, addressing the secondary. And there's a few secondary picks in here because it's not, it's probably the worst room on the Giants aside from receiver. Uh, you get Newbin, who's my top safety in the class, who is really just this, like, in a way, a true... Um, traditional safety almost where he plays this like strong safety type role even though that's not how teams operate i think he's he's a good um kind of so, some jabril peppers um similarities if you kind of remember him for the giants uh andrew phillips slot from kentucky you know uh, tfg that franchise guy is very high on him which was weird to me um because i i wasn't quite uh i think he had him like corner six that's not quite where i'm at on him um you know, so I was, I was surprised by that because I don't, I feel like I'm not seeing that anywhere. So I went back and watched a little bit of his and it didn't really change anything. Um, but for me, he's still a, a good, you know, slot to get here in the third where uh, just because your starting slot right now is a uh, critical flat, he's probably starting for you. But um, like he's, he's good enough to do it. I just don't know if he's going to be like you know, a, a great corner. Um, then Jalen Polk in the fourth round, you know, he's a, a solid receiver. I think uh, I, I hate to keep saying solid with so many of these guys, but like realistically, you know, um, most of these guys will probably end up being solid at the best. Right. So that's just how I feel about most of these guys past, you know, day two where it's like, um, the same thing with Jalen Polk, where it's just, you know, he, I think he'll be a solid receiver that's probably an end of the depth chart guy and not much more, you know. Johnny Dixon, corner from Penn State. I think he's got slot versatility, but obviously he just took Phillips. I like him as an outside corner as well, just getting something to that room because you didn't really address outside corner as much, but, you know, you just drafted Banks. Uh, and then Javon Foster in the sixth, who has the potential to be a good backup, just, you know, hasn't, um, for me, never really 
developed his game as much as I'd liked at Missouri. Um, but he could be one of those guys where just once he gets to the NFL, um, who knows, right? He might get the proper coaching. I don't know who the Giants O line coach is, um, but he's developed, you know, Andrew Thomas and uh, didn't go the same with Evan Neal, but he developed Andrew Thomas, unless it's a different guy. I don't know. I don't know who the Giants O line coach is. But um, with the Jets here, I have some interesting thoughts. Um, because I know some people are really going to hate this, but I went J.J. McCarthy at 10. And, you know, I just, I feel like it's a perfect situation where, like, let, let's be honest. I know the Jets are going all in this year. And and to be fair, I, I might have gone Bowers if he was still here. And Adunze was gone by this point, too. Um, I just think it's the perfect situation for Zach Wilson, where... I know Nathaniel Hackett's not a guy you want developing a quarterback, but if you give a year um, of Zach Wilson, I, I've been saying Zach Wilson, have I? J.J. McCarthy, um, if you give him a year under Aaron Rodgers, I think you're doing him a lot of favors because he's a guy that, you know, his game's already very matured, and I think I talked about him a little bit earlier, but he's a, he's a co- uh, quarterback that coaches are going to love and teams are going to love because there's a reason he projected projected to go top five because like I said I, I think I was talking about him earlier at some point but the the fact that he ran the Michigan offense so efficiently and just very rarely made dumb mistakes you know he it was it was an easy offense but he took advantage of that and yet he still had several good performances and a lot of great throws all over his tape where you just see a guy who wasn't asked to do a lot which in a way is a fair critique because we've not seen that true pressure on him but at the end of the day the guy's a winner you know even he's he's clearly able to accept a role and even if that role is a facilitator and letting the ground game thrive, um, he, he's perfectly fine with it, and he's very good at doing it. So if you give him a year under Rodgers to kind of uh, mature his game even more, develop, and then you know you go into next year where you're you're not now automatically screwed out of your Super Bowl window because right now they kind of are. I'm, I really do think this is Rodgers' last year, and we don't even know if he's going to be back to his old self. And after this year. When Rodgers retires, I mean, what are you doing? You know, I mean, you're not going to be uh, a top pick next year. So I don't know. This just kind of felt like the right, um, right move. And then I went Malachi Corley at in the third, who is a uh, you know a lot of people compare him to Debo Samuel. I don't think he's quite the same player. Like I wouldn't comp him to, to Samuel. Um, I'd probably comp him more to like a Rashi Rice with without legal issues. Um, you know, so I think adding that to the Jets offense where you've got your Garrett Wilson already, you signed Mike Williams, I think Cor- Corley adds that like missing piece to the offense. So even though you didn't take a guy in the first round, you don't have a second round pick, with a guy like Corley, you're still upgrading the offense to make it, you know, better for Rodgers this year. Jarvis Brownlee feels like a Jets corner to me. I can't explain why. He just does. He's a very physical corner. Um, and I think there's a potential there that he could um, be starting next to Sauce uh, at a point. Trey Taylor is another guy I really like here for the Jets and uh, Robert Sala's defense. Uh, went to Air Force, doesn't have any correlation with the Jets, but uh, you know it's a fun little thing, and I think he just fits really well. He's an athletic safety, and I like him as you know kind of that uh, what Ashton Davis is supposed to be, but just never turned into. Will Shipley again just feels like a Jets running back to me. Um, with with Brees Hall, I think makes a really nice duo. So getting that in the sixth round, Tylen Grable, kind of a you know, th- those are the last two picks of the draft right there. So you know, Grable and Mitchell, um, some solid players um, that maybe could make the roster. I'd bet against it, but maybe uh, I'd say Mitchell has a better chance than Grable. With the Eagles, I got them calling uh, Cooper Dejean who I've listed as defensive back because a lot of teams view him as a safety. And I really do think he can still play corner. I, I That's where I have have him listed. I still have him ranked at corner. But if a team just wants to put him at safety, I mean, that's fine by me. The dude is athletic as shit. Uh, there's no way around it. He, and, and the fact that he was dealing with an injury, too, and had the pro day that he did. Um, you know, we don't, we don't evaluate off pro days, right? Like, we don't, we don't bump a guy up because he has a good pro day or a good combine performance. But... Um, he's athletic, man, and he just reinforced that. 
and he's he's just brings so many things to the game for you where he can play slot for sure he can play corner he can play safety he's a, a damn good kick returner um this is a great pick here for the eagles in my opinion and they followed up with ricky Purcell, who is a future oriented pick because the eagles receiver room is low-key kind of thin and we don't know if Devontae smith is going to stick around because you know i think you look at it like they're paying AJ, uh, AJ Brown a lot of money, and I think Devontae Smith is probably going to end up wanting number one money um, because I think he, he does have that talent. It's just that when you're the number two on the team, so who knows, right? Maybe he takes a discount, but uh, this is a future-oriented pick because even if he stays, you need a three, and if not, I think Pearsall can be a two at the next level. He's a really talented receiver um, with... with um, you know, he's got a nice frame to him, and he uses his, he, he has good range. He's not got great range. Um, we're not talking, you know, Marvin Harrison here, but he's got good range. Mo Camara in the second round as well is a great fit, in my opinion. Um, from CSU, you know, he's a guy who doesn't have the best motor in the world, but is very efficient with his hand use, and I, I really think is technically sound um, about as good as it comes. So a guy who is, again, not going to be a high-level pass rusher, but can be this, like, um, you know, like Josh Sweat, but better. Um Kind of like a, a current Brandon Graham, not comparison wise, but just like level of player. You're getting a guy that I think can replace Brandon Graham once he's uh, retired. Chris Jenkins is your kind of freak of the list uh, for the Eagles because you know they like having those, especially on defense. Um, they just they collect these freaky defensive linemen like Pokemon cards, and Chris Jenkins is just another one of those for them. Isaiah Johnson from Syracuse. They need a uh, defensive back help beyond just one pick. Even though they took Dejean, that's only one player. You get Johnson, who I think is a good fit back there. Ray Davis, who is a... Um, you know, we've had a theme of where I like to come up with those little names for running backs. I don't know if I have a good one for him because he's just he's just good. You know, like he's not great. He's not bad. Um, he's just good. He will be a solid um, down to down runner. You know, I like him on first and third down. And, you know, I, I just think he, he gives the Eagles running back room something they don't have because right now it's, you know, uh, Kenny Gainwell is the number two, I think, right now. Number one, I should know who it is. Um, and now I'm going to look it up because I'm mad that I don't know who it is. I know it's not Miles Sanders. He's in, he's on Carolina. Um, Saquon Barkley. Duh. Um, I knew I was thinking. Like, I was, I was like, I know they have a starting running back. Um, duh. So, yeah, I think even with that, it's remember, like, at the time it was like, oh, yeah, Saquon and Ray Davis. Um, I just can't, like keep everything up at once but they're a very nice duo where you have Saquon who's more of this bouncy like in a way a one cut back but so much more to his game obviously and he's gonna feast in Philadelphia so then you give him this you know number two who's uh kind of it just brings what Saquon doesn't have great strengths of necessarily where you know he's, he can't just go down the middle and uh he can but he doesn't like shove guys out of the way that's where, where that's what Ray Davis does um he's a freight train Jaheim Bell from LFSU, not LFSU, FSU, um, who is kind of this like, um, I forget the abbreviation for it, but like he's not a, uh, he's not a tight end, general tight end. Um, basically, this is a guy that you're going to use around the field, right? He can play fullback. Honestly, you can put him at run back on some snaps. Uh, generically a tight end, but he's just never really developed into um, what you want from a true tight end. So, you know, like I said, he's kind of this like um, moves around the field guy. Just a fun, you know, addition for the Eagles offense. And then Miller Bradford, who is kind of just another one of those like, you know, he might make the roster, um, but we need defensive back help. So, and I think he fits. With the Pittsburgh Steelers, we have first Jackson Powers Johnson, who is one of my favorite players in the class. He's going to be a very good interior lineman wherever he plays. I think center's best, but like he can absolutely play guard as well. Um, he's, he's a guy who just thrives when you get him on the move, but also just dominates dudes at the line. You know, I said it about... Um, about Walt Frazier earlier where he just likes to dominate dudes and it's the same thing with Jackson Powers Johnson he just he enjoys um <laughs> he enjoys dominating men you know not not to sound weird but uh Jordan Morgan 
who is such a Steelers tackle, um, just this big athletic um, player who they can kind of just mold into whatever they want. So you're addressing a line here with the first two picks after you took Broderick Jones last year, um, and you're just you're establishing a very young and very good offensive line. Um, MJ uh, Devonshire, who is again one of those like little oh, stink in Pittsburgh, um, but I think he fits as well. They need corner, and I, I think he'd uh, form a really nice duo with uh, Joey Porter. Uh, he's he's this like I really like him as a slot. I don't or as a slot. I don't like him as a slot. Um, I really like him as like a boundary guy who just you know he he um, he's his own corner. I think I don't think he's a man, but he. I think that fits with the Steelers. And then Maris Leofau from Notre Dame, Notre Dame, um, who is a, I don't know if it would be saying who is is getting boring or not, but uh, Maris Leofau is someone who was much higher on my board for a while. And then, you know, you just, one of those guys where you dive in deeper and it's like, okay, he doesn't do this as well. He's not, um, he's not great in the run defense, to be honest, which is kind of the, the sole thing keeping him out because for a while, you know, he was up there with the top linebackers. And obviously I still have him as a, you know, late third here. I still view him as someone who can be, um, maybe a starter someday, but most likely he's, he's very good depth. Jaquan Jackson from Tulane, who is, you know, a pretty solid uh, slot type guy, but can also go outside just, you know, one of those, you know, get a skill position players. He's one of the better ones in like the later rounds. Cedric Johnson from Ole Miss, I think fits Mike Tomlin's defense really well. You know, they don't need outside backer too much, but like that's where he'd play. And I think he'd be good at it. And then Malik Mustafa, who is a hard, hard hitting safety from Wake Forest who, uh, to be honest, I don't know if besides the hard-hitting thing, he has any other like elite traits to him, but regardless, he's he's a very physical safety, and that there's always some value to be held there. So, um, you know, will he end up starting along Minka? I don't know, but like he's a, he's a good player to have in that room. The 49ers, who have a lot of draft picks this year, um, are going to go J.C. Latham first up, where he is um, listed as guard slash tackle, and... I, I, I think he can play tackle, but I don't think he has the athleticism to to really thrive at tackle. And so that's why I wonder, you know, with, with the 49ers here, right, um, I think he could play guard regardless, and he'd probably be better at guard than tackle. But with the 49ers here, where, like, you're probably going to try and give Colton McKivitz another year. Um, you're, you know, at the 31st pick here, your line wasn't great in the Super Bowl and stuff. Um, get an interior guy who can kick outside if need be, maybe takes over for, um, uh, I just said his name. God, um, maybe he takes over for McKivitz after a year or so. Uh, maybe you try McKivitz out at left tackle since Trent Williams is getting older. Who knows? But you're getting a lineman here who um, has some nice upside, but I, I think is a guard more likely than a tackle. Um, Tyke Smith from Georgia is my safety three in the class. Goes a few picks after his teammate Bullard, who's my two. Um, Tyke, you know, I prefer Bullard a little bit more, but Tyke's still uh, a very good safety who's, who brings a different type of skill set, whereas Bullard it's actually kind of funny how, how similar they are to like Hyde Poyer, where Bullard is very much the Poyer and Smith is very much more the Hyde. Um, they're not one for one, but like it's that's if that's the way you want to imagine it, right? So I think pairing him up with Hufanga is a really good uh, safety pairing there for San Francisco. Adisa Isaac from Penn State is a you know not as not as athletic as a, a lot of these Penn State edge rushers are. Um, the other one in this class, Chop Robinson, is pretty much just straight up an athlete. You know that they're hoping will turn into a football player. Um, whereas Isaac is uh, pretty unathletic for for most Penn State pass rushing norms. Uh, regardless of that, I think he fits very well with the 49ers defense and would be a great get. Uh, you know because they kind of. They, they drafted Jake Jackson, and then, you know, they got rid of Eric Armstead, obviously, to sign, like, a few okay guys. I mean, I think you're, you need to find a guy who's, like, um, I, I trust could honestly be a starter in a year or two. Quantez Stiggers is one of my favorite players in the class because he actually didn't, um, he didn't, he's not from a college, he's from the CFL, um, the Toronto Argonauts, because he had a really weird story where he um, was going to school down in Florida, I want to say, or somewhere southeast. And I think it was his father that passed, so he ended up um, dropping out of school, or he just he ended up not going, not finishing college, and then somehow or another ended up in the CFL and just impressed so much. And you know, it's it's hard to find tape of him, 
But from the games you can watch of him, you know, from the CFL and everything, the dude's a good corner. I think this is someone who genuinely, in a few years, we might look back on and say, um, he should have gone higher and i think it it could end up being solely because he's had this weird path to the nfl and there's not a ton of tape available of him and everything but the stuff that you can find of him is really impressive uh so this is a guy where again i think if he'd gone to college traditional way i mean we could be talking about him as a early day two maybe even a late day one guy he's he is that talented uh christian jones is a tackle that i would trust the 49ers to develop i think he's a super developmental tackle um so maybe this is in the situation we're like, um, maybe Trent Williams retires after this year. So now you got Latham at right tackle, McKivitz at left tackle. Um, or, you know, maybe you have Jones at left tackle and then you can kick McKivitz in the guard or, or kick, keep McKivitz at right tackle, keep Latham in guard. You're just giving yourself options here um, for the line who, you know, needs like Trent Williams is great, obviously. But besides that, the line's not too much to write home about. And then kind of continuing that philosophy with C.J. Hansen, who I actually like a lot more than Christian Jones, um, but I just felt Jones was a better pick at the time, but then we picked three picks later anyways. Um, but C.J. Hansen is definitely one of my guys. Um, I think, you know, from Holy Cross, he's, he's from a smaller school where, you know, not, not a lot of people know about him, but C.J. Hansen, I think, is someone to really keep your eye on and who could also honestly probably sneak into the third round as kind of a, you know, a surprise pick for a lot of people, but could end up being really dang good. Good, especially for the right team like the 49ers where he fits very very well uh tyrone tracy is your your new backup to christian mccaffrey most likely i think they've got similar skill sets but tracy's maybe a bit better of a pure runner um, but nowhere near the the receiving back that uh, mccaffrey is kingsley uh Guacan from florida is kind of just a stash depth pick really i mean could he turn into a starter maybe but uh probably not Austin Reed from Western Kentucky. You need a backup quarterback. They signed Josh Dobbs. Um, you know, he's, he's, he's Josh Dobbs. Uh, I think Austin Reed fits very well with Shanahan's system and, you know, kind of one of those quarterbacks that we talked about earlier where I just feel good that he's able to, to really, you know, um, just complete the the play right he's just going to follow the system he's not going to deviate and uh doesn't have like the the best uh play creation right so if a, a play does go awry i mean uh you're probably not doing much which is why he's a backup but you know he's he's a solid get here in the six and then like this might be a very controversial i'm not sure i've got brendan rice in the seventh because i don't like brendan rice and it just like it almost reminds me of like the Thaddeus Moss uh, from a few years ago where like some people were very high on Thaddeus Moss and like I'm sorry but just just because you're the son of an of an all-time great NFL player does not mean that you are a great NFL player and I don't see anything there with Rice to be honest like he's a he's a depth piece to me that um, maybe makes a roster and that's about it I could look I could end up looking very very stupid for that take um, as well as a lot of these takes but like I don't I just don't see it. But, like, of course, it's fun, you know, just because, like, San Francisco, Jerry Rice, Brandon Rice, you know. Um, with the Seahawks here, and we're almost to the end now, so thank you guys for sticking through this whole thing. We have four teams left. Um, is uh, Jerzon Newton at 16, who's maybe the premier pass rush threat of this interior class um, because he's not all that much to write home about in run defense. He's not bad, but he's not, you know, he's, he's just, he's a little below average. But as a pass production guy from the interior, he's about as good as they get out of the draft. He's very um, well rounded and just like, um, I mean, I have him above Leatu and all the other edge rushers besides Dallas Turner, right? Like he's he's a very well mature. There's a there's a maturity to his game. Like he knows what he's doing. He's very methodical about how he handles the pass rush and just how he chains moves together. There's a lot to like about Newton, and uh, my current projection for him actually right now is that he's going to replace. Um, uh, Christian Wilkins in Miami and I think that's like perfect because if you were to give him down there I like this could be a, a Justin Matabuki um level player you know maybe even better and then Trevin Wallace in the third I think is a really really good fit with Mike Mike McDonald what why, where does Mike McDonald come from um unless I'm right I, I'm having a bad day with names when you're talking about so many guys um I swear to god it's Mike McDonald um yeah, Mike McDonald. So anyways, back to normal. I think he's a very good fit. And, you know, they didn't really go after linebacker all that much. I'm not sure where Jordan Brooks went. He might have just resigned. But uh, they didn't end up signing Roquan Smith, which good on them. So, you know, they need linebacker help. I think he's a really good fit there with Seattle. 
Dylan McMahon is uh, probably your center of the future. I really like him, even though it's in uh, early fourth round. He's a pretty good center prospect from North Carolina State, who, like I said, will probably be starting for you soon. So I like this draft so far for Seattle. Austin Booker is a very much like one of those guys where he's not developmental. He's just going to need time, if that makes sense, where it's more so about the teams trying to understand where he really fits because like i really think the dude would probably end up best if he like gained 20 pounds and just kind of was a pure three tech you know so kind of like playing that leonard williams role i really do think would be beneficial for him but I think he's more of a stand-up pass rusher the way he's built and the way he plays right now. Um, but at the same time, he's also not phenomenal at doing that. He's got flashes, but like I think they're more better appropriated to, you know, kind of hands in the dirt um, type pass rusher. So, you know, I, he's a weird player, but I, I like the fit at least with Seattle. Like I think Mike McDonald could turn him into something good. Uh, Kamal Hadden, Hadden from Tennessee, who's a, a bigger corner um, you know, lengthwise and stuff, and it's just a solid little get here for, you know, a corner room that's not too full. Uh, Brevin Span Ford, who is one of the premier blocking tight ends of this class, along with Tip Raymond. Obviously, I prefer Raymond a bit, but uh, with Span Ford, and that's that's also because Raymond, I think, has some receiving upside. With Span Ford, you know what you're getting? Like, he has a pure blocking tight end. He's never going to be anything more. But there's value in that, and your only tight end on the roster right now since Parkinson and, um, Disley left that's worth anything is is a, a Fant who is not a blocking tight end so I think they they make up here um and then uh Cornelius Johnson who is another one of those like I just really like the fit there with um the the Washington guy that came over um Ryan Grubbs I think is who I'm thinking of I like the fit there um I think he'd know how to use him and he'd be a nice like um Honestly, he could replace Tyler Lockett if, if Lockett's going to get up, go anytime soon or whatever, um, but otherwise could be a good, like, 3-4 um, since you drafted Jackson, uh, Smith, and Jigba. Moving on to the Buccaneers, and uh, I went Chop Robinson here because they really need that, like, high upside pass rusher. They've been attempting to get these guys on, on kind of the edge interior where, you know, you, you drafted Logan Hall, you drafted Tryon Inca, Shaq Barrett's now gone. Um, you know, because he, he just fell off after the injury and everything. Um, you're getting that guy that's that high upside player where, like I said just a little bit ago, he is genuinely just a, an athlete who they hope can play football. I mean, that's really, I think, the best way to put it. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if he goes way higher than this because some team's going to be, you know, frothing at the mouth because this, I'm sure some teams genuinely believe he can be the best pass rusher in this class. I'm not there. I, I really do think he's he's got a higher chance of being a bust than a hit but the the upside if he does hit is absolutely worth taking in my opinion which is why he's a first round player still for me um junior colson in the second is a really interesting guy who in a way is almost still addressing uh the pass rush because this is a guy i could genuinely potentially t see taking like a micah parsons type path to his career obviously the the buccaneers do not run the same defense at all as dallas so it's not a one for one but like as a blitzing linebacker he's maybe the best in the class um he's up there with edger and cooper but the the other thing is that he's he's still really good in pass coverage um most of the time you know i i mean let me ret retract that extreme. He's not really good. It's just there's flashes for sure, which is why he's my linebacker three, I want to say. There's flashes for sure, and we, we could be looking at him as um, a, a a good starting linebacker in the future as like a top 15 guy. Uh, there's a lot of upside there, but like he's not, um, he's not developed his pass coverage to where it needs to be to be an elite linebacker yet, but he can get there, and he's worth the pick. Uh, Kate Stover from Ohio State is a guy that I've been up and down on. A lot of those in this class where, you know, I, this is probably the one that I've ended up kind of coming full circle and, and being much higher on than I was originally. 
where when you, you kind of look at it more, um, I think you just get the feeling that like, yeah, this is going to be um, probably a, a starting tight end at the next level. He's never going to be a top 15, maybe a fringe top 20 guy, but this is a starting tight end that will probably serve us better than um, Kate Otten. And then uh, Kalen Carson in the third as well, who is a, just a solid corner from Wake Forest, has some nice athletic upside. So there's, there's potential uh, to be a starter, kind of that um, Carlton Davis I believe is who they traded to Detroit um, replacement. Christian Mahogany. Um, sorry if you just heard that from my computer. Um, Christian Mahogany is a hog in the, the middle of the offensive line. Uh, I'm a little lower on him just because like it's been a few years at Boston College. I don't think he's developed his game um, to quite the degree that I'd want from a guy to take him much higher than this for interior. So like I do feel he's probably about where he's going to play in the NFL but at the same time he was also just a really solid guard so like if you can get a guy who will probably be just a solid guard um in the fourth I mean it's it's a win Zakari Franklin at receiver who is uh you know kind of a mix of Bucks receivers and the receiver they don't have um kind of a Scotty Miller-ish type player but I don't think he's there in Tampa Bay anymore he might be I don't know um and in which case then I don't know if you go Franklin but um he's kind of a Scotty Miller-ish type guy who can play the the three I think probably because he's better than Scotty Miller though is the thing um yeah, Scotty Miller's not very good so they still need some receiving help uh and I like Franklin here and then Eric Watts who is kind of just like a you know, another one of those late round picks where um, there's some potential he could make the roster as kind of like a backup. I think he'd uh, fit well, you know, behind Logan Hall and stuff. But besides that, you know, not much more. Two left, we have the Tennessee Titans, who I have going Olu Fashanu at seven, who, you know, I, I've, I don't know how many times I've said who in this video. Um, a very athletic tackle. And. I get that some people don't agree with that, like that he they don't think he's that great of an athlete actually, that he's, he's really sucky in the run game and the, the pad. In my opinion, I think he's an athletic guy. I think that the run game is definitely something to be desired, but as a pass blocker, um, he's absolutely worth the seventh pick. Like, obviously you'd prefer Joe Alt. He doesn't touch Joe Alt, right? I'm not, <laughs> like not in any way. I was, I was praising the hell out of Alt. You know, he's gonna have a gold jacket someday. Fashanu could very well end up being a bust. You know, I'm not near as high on him, but but he's still definitely worth the seventh pick um, because he, yeah, he really is. He's, he's a very good pass blocker, I think, and there's still upside there and he can be developed. And the Titans arguably have the best line coach in the league. So if you're going to give a guy who, you know, has some issues regarding like, oh, he's not the best run blocker, you know, give him the best O line coach in the NFL, that might not be an issue. Uh, they go Xavier Worthy with uh, their second round pick, which I really like because. You know, you have uh, DeAndre Hopkins, who is your obviously your, like your downfield um, jump ball guy, pretty much. You know, at this stage of his career, he's not the the jump ball guy, but he's is a good deep receiver. And then you sign Calvin Ridley, um, who is similar, but like not quite. He's he's much better in the mid range, I think, right now. And there's still upside to be there. But you you add a guy like Worthy, who just brings a, a speed element you just don't have. Um, in the offense, you know, so when you, um, yeah, I mean, just it's simple as that. When you when you don't have that guy who can really get downfield, um, you you know, get him. I guess like that's as simple as it is. I'm I'm trying to think of how to explain it otherwise, but like just that that trio of Hopkins, Ridley, and Worthy, I think, is really setting up uh, Levis nicely. Uh, and then you skip around, you get to Jalex Hunt who I think um, is a solid, you know, kind of get for there, maybe starting, but probably a, a really good rotational player for Tennessee. I think he really fits. Garrett Greenfield, you're double dipping at tackle, but like you still need depth. And Greenfield's a guy that I could see developing and really coming along. So if you could potentially get your starting left and right tackle in the same class, um, one of them from the fifth round, uh, W. Uh, Tyron Hopper, from Missouri, who is kind of one of those, like, they need a linebacker. Let's give him a big linebacker who is definitely better in run defense than he is in pass um, 
it's pass coverage, but uh, you know, he's, a, he's a one trick pony, but he's, he's solid at what he's a one trick pony at. And then Ryan Watts, who is, you know, like a, a later developmental type uh, safety, I'd say is probably where he ends up playing, uh, but he can play outside, I think as well. So um, I don't know if I like him in the slot as much, but as a corner outside corner and like safety, he's a, a versatile guy that, you know, maybe makes the roster. Tory Horton is your other receiver from CSU who just, you know, is, is again, one of those solid late round guys where like he, he might end up being a five or a six. Um, I like his after the catch ability, but besides that, I wouldn't say there's anything much that's like a, a something to take down note about. And then AJ Barner, who's just like a, a one of, another one of those solid guys where, um, you know, he's, he's not going to be anything special with the tight end room. You know, he probably is the your two behind Chig at best. Um, but, you know, he's not, not much to write home about as a blocker. He's much more of a kind of a, I think he's, he's good on sending out. He'd be a good number two for Tennessee where, you know, they don't, they don't necessarily keep him inside the block much. Just send him out there on the little um, post routes and stuff. And I think he, he works for that. Um, and then lastly, we finally got into the end. Uh, thank you for sticking with me if you've made it through the whole thing. Uh, but we got the Washington Commanders who go Drake May at two. And I I really um, don't understand them going Jaden Daniels personally. Like, I think Jaden Daniels is a, uh, a quarterback that has some really nice running ability, but like he had a lot of help at LSU with Malik Neighbors and Brian Thomas. Um, he had a solid line for sure. Some very great players. And there's going to be a very high pick tackle next year on that LSU offensive line. Um, I feel like between him and May, where May does have some more inaccuracy and, and almost some consistency issues than Daniels, everything else is better in my opinion. And he's not even that much of worse of a runner. Like I, I'm, I would maybe make the argument may is even the a better runner than Daniels. Um, like his pocket presence is something to be worked on. And like, he doesn't have, um, the, the most, the, like he has a strong arm, but it's not like the most elastic in the world. Uh, whereas Daniels does have an elastic arm. I don't know. I just, I guess I, I don't really see much of an argument in my opinion. In most other classes, May would be quarterback one. Um, I don't know. This is absolutely where I'd go if I was uh, Washington. So I don't know. It, I think it ends up being Daniels, but for me, it's easily May. He's just the better prospect. He's just, um, I guess I didn't really talk about what he does too well. I did say he's a great runner, but also, you know, just he's he's got really nice accuracy at times. Like I know it's not always great, but like when he hits, he hits and he makes these incredible throws at times where like the upside is 110% there. And I don't even see how you can deny that like there's absolutely um, multiple outcomes where this guy becomes the best quarterback of the class, even with a guy as good as Caleb Williams. So for me, it's the easy pick. I don't know. I just, that's where I'd go. Uh, Kingsley Masuo Matea is uh, maybe not the way everyone would go. Like he's going to be very um, rough at the start, but this is a guy who's uh, got a, an insane amount of upside at the tackle position. Who is a, a crazy good athlete, and I, I like it when you we have tackles that are just these athletes, but they also, while they're not the most technically sound. They also clearly show that they're, they're, I mean, he gives, he gives big effort on every play. This is a guy that is going to be a starting tackle at some point. So while it might not be year one, or if they do, do start him, it'll be rough. Um, I, I love him as a, a tackle for the future there for Drake May. And then you switch to the other side of the ball where you get Marshawn Nealon. And this is one of my favorite picks of the draft because there's similarities to like a Dorrance Armstrong who followed, um, you know, Dan Quinn over to Washington. I don't know why I said it that way, uh, who followed Dan Quinn over to Washington. And Marshawn Nealon, I honestly like more than Doran Armstrong. I think he's got a higher ceiling and these really nice physical tools. And he, they were on full display at Western Michigan. Like, you know what you're getting in this? Like, this is a guy with, with some big hands that at times are just going to manhandle you, you know, and, and there's not much you can do about it. And it's fun to watch, uh, especially some highlights of his. So, uh, you know, I think it's a good pickup there. They need pass rush still. Jatavian Sanders in the third is about where I feel proper for him to go. Um, he's not much of a blocker, you know, so 
he's really definitely more of a receiving threat, and I didn't address receiver really until later on. But the Commanders have a lot of early picks, and you know, Sanders, like I said, he's not a blocker. He's definitely a receiving tight end, and I think he would easily be the best tight end on Washington right now. I just don't know if he's going to be like a great tight end. Like he's nowhere near Brock Bowers. Um, I've seen some stuff of like, you know, what if I told you Brock Bowers was not that much better than Jatavian Sanders? I don't. I'm, I'm not on that level at all. I think Sanders will be a, a fine tight end at the next level, like, you know, a, a low-end starter. Um, Dadrian Taylor Demerson, I know some people were waiting for me to talk about him, and he'll probably go higher than this. I think the hype's gotten a little too high on him. Like, I like him, especially as this, like, um, it, it just really is like, um, he zeroes in. I mean, he's a, he's a missile, really. He's a little missile that it's like he always knows where the ball is, and he he's just an all-around good safety, you know? I mean, like, this is a weaker safety class, um, so naturally these guys are going to fall a little bit and stuff. Even though it's the third round, it's a very good get, and I think we could talk about him as, as one of the, the steals of the draft um, in the future. And then Johnny Wilson, who is another one of these interesting players where I got him as tight end wide receiver, I, I get a team wanting to try him at receiver. I do. Um, and it's my first attempt with Washington here to get a receiver. Um, but I've, I really think he's a tight end at the next level. And at that, I don't know if he's a good tight end. So, you know, the commanders don't have a good tight end room and so that's why you add these two guys here and i think they they make the room automatically a lot better and there's upside there with wilson at a receive at receiver but like i don't think he'll hit it i don't think he's a receiver um and then Devontez walker and, and by the way with wilson like let me just say it's it's mainly because he's just not a route runner like he's he's not good at running routes and it just that feels like a tight end to me um but then my first true receiver i take for washington and the only one is Devontez walker uh, or tez walker who has really really fallen from grace and not for me so much because i always had him kind of like that early day three conversation but um for the people that had him going as like a you know a first round at a point he got that high hype um he just had a really really rough um postseason like when it came to the combine pro day uh, drills just really really rough and he definitely lost himself a lot of money but i this is another one of those guys where we could look at back on it in a few years and be like i don't know why we overreacted you know i feel fine taking him here late day two early day three as like a solid developmental receiver who uh you know probably be a three but i think could be a two someday uh patrick paul is a tackle i'm not the biggest fan of i think this is about right for him i feel pretty good if as a backup, I don't think he's got starting upside personally. I just don't think he's got the the for the step, the athleticism, um, or the power, to be honest. So it's just like, you know, I don't I feel like he's lacking in the major areas. He's not a horrific tackle by any means. He's just not got any elite traits really. And then the last pick, our very last one is Will Richard out of Alabama. Uh Washington lost their kicker, Joey Sly, to um Jacksonville, I wanna say. And uh, they need a kicker, and I'm going to go with Richard here, who was very consistent from all ranges at Alabama. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a, he's a good kicker. You know, I have him drafted for a reason. But that is going to be my seven-round mock. Again, thank you guys so much for, if you somehow sat through this whole thing um, and just listened to me talk for, like, two hours. I bet you this video will probably be. Um, yeah, let me know down below uh, what you liked, what you didn't like, what you want your team to do, what do you not want your team to do, who are your favorite players. Just let's talk about the draft. I invite you to especially if you've listened all the way through i think you know you'd love my content if you if you really enjoyed this so um if you're hearing this I, i'd recommend subscribing but you don't have to um but i'd like it so uh, thank you guys so much for watching um i probably will do um i've been thinking about doing some like redrafts from like 10 20 years ago um you can find some of those on my channel but like my, my my next video might just be like my final mock um i don't know when that'll come out but uh, this was a big process so i need a little break anyways uh, but again thank you guys so much for watching and i will see you guys in the next video Bye bye